the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning. We welcome everyone who is attending this public hearing in the Royal Commission's Brisbane hearing room. We also welcome everyone who is or will be following the proceedings through the live stream. This is the 33rd public hearing and the final substantive hearing of the Royal Commission. We commence the hearing with an acknowledgement of country and I invite Commissioner Andrea Mason to make the acknowledgement. Thank you, Chair. We acknowledge Majin Brisbane. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Turrbal and Jagera nations. We acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagera nations as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands upon which this Royal Commission is sitting. We acknowledge and pay our deep respect to elders past and present, and we acknowledge First Nations young people who one day will take their place as elders. We extend that respect to all First Nations people and acknowledge their enduring connection to land, sky, seas and waters. We pay our deep respect to First Nations people here today and who are following this public hearing online on the mainland and on islands, including Tasmania and in the Torres Strait, especially elders, parents and young people with disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. I am Commissioner Alastair McEwen, I am and I will be presiding at this public hearing. I'm joined in the Brisbane hearing room by Commissioner Andrea Mason, RAM, and Commissioner John Ryan, AM. Council assisting the Royal Commission at the hearing is Ms Kate Eastman, AMSC, who appears with Ms Gillian Mahoney. They are assisted by the Office of the Solicitor assisting the Royal Commission. I will shortly take appearances. Over the next three days, we will focus on the treatment of two young men named Caleb and Jonathan. I note that these are not their real names. They are brothers. They both have intellectual, intellectual disability and other disabilities. In May 2020, a family friend alerted the Queensland Ambulance and Queensland Police to the young men's home. When they arrived, they found Caleb and Jonathan locked in their bedroom, unclothed and malnourished. Their father, who was their sole carer, was deceased in the next room. This public hearing will examine the circumstances leading up to the, to the death of Caleb and Jonathan's father. It will examine whether Caleb and Jonathan experienced violence, abuse, neglect, and the deprivation of human rights in their lives. A human rights approach has been central to the Royal Commission's work. At our opening hearing in September 2019, the chair of the Royal Commission, the Honourable Ronald Sackville AOKC, said our terms of reference expressly refer to Australia's obligations under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, CRPD. And he said it means that this Royal Commission must have a rights-based focus. We must take as our starting point the rights under international law that Australia is required to recognise and protect for people with disability. The Chair referred to Article 16 of the CRPD, which requires Australia to take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social, educational and other measures to protect people with disability, both within 
and outside the home from all forms of exploitation, violence, and abuse. The chair also referred to the Convention on the Rights of the Child being important for children with disabilities. Article 23 of that convention provides that children who have any kind of disability should receive special care and support so that they can live a full and independent life with an emphasis on dignity and promoting self-reliance in facilitating active participation in the community. We expect this public hearing will consider these human rights and also provide the Royal Commission with the opportunity to consider how the Queensland Human Rights Act operates to respect, protect and fulfil the rights of children and young people with disabilities. We also expect that this hearing will consider many of the other human rights we have considered and, and examined in this Royal Commission, particularly with respect to systems and policy to enable people with disability to live lives free of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. I shall, I shall now take appearances. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appear as counsel assisting for this public hearing with Ms Marnie. Yep. Thank you. Yes, good morning, Commissioners. My name is McMillan, initials KA, Queen for Council, and I appear with Ms Amos, instructed by Crown Law of Queensland. Thank you, Ms McMillan. Good morning, Chair, and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Anderson. I appear with Ms Munro. We're instructed by Gilbert and Tobin and appear for the Commonwealth Witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I will now ask Ms. Eastman to make her opening statement. Thank you. Council assisting acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands on which we're meeting today and across Australia. We pay our respects to First Nations elders, past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Nations people following this public hearing. Before I start, Commissioners, I'll ask that the content warning be displayed. Commissioners, you will hear about incidents of violence, abuse, neglect and the deprivation of human rights of two young men who live with disability. The description of their treatment and the circumstances in which these two young men were living will be confronting and distressing. The Royal Commission encourages those watching, whether by the web stream or here in person, to be mindful that topics may trigger or cause distress. And we encourage everyone to seek support in that respect. Well, Commissioners, let me tell you about Caleb and Jonathan. This hearing is about them and their life course over 22 years. Caleb and Jonathan, each live with intellectual disability and other disabilities. They both have limited verbal communication and they communicate using sounds and gestures and some speech. Jonathan also lives with epilepsy and suffers seizures. Their father, Paul Barrett, was, for most of their lives, their sole carer. Early on the morning of 27 May 2020, a friend of Mr Barrett's called Queensland Ambulance Service about Caleb, Jonathan and their father. When the emergency services arrived at the family home, they found Mr Barrett deceased. Caleb and Jonathan were locked in a room, naked, and there was no bedroom furnishing. Queensland police also attended the home they observed faeces on the floor of the spare bedroom and the main bedroom. Caleb and Jonathan's bedroom was completely bare with the door handles removed. Caleb was then 19 years old and Jonathan was 17 years old. Our commissioners, a photo is going to come up on the screen now. I warn those following the uh, hearing that these photos may be confronting. 
Commissioners, the photos which are on the screen are of the family home on 28 May 2020, the day after Caleb and Jonathan were found. The first photo, which is on the screen now, is of the father's bedroom. It shows a stained mattress without bedding with, and there is a pillow. There's a large curtain on the far wall and a blanket on the floor. There are various food and bottle containers on bedside drawers and at the base of the mattress. The second photo is of Caleb and Jonathan's bedroom. You cannot see the whole room, but what is in the photo is a bare room without furnishings. There is no curtain against the window and there are various marks on the wall. There are what looks like used nappies on the floor. On the day Caleb and Jonathan were found, they were taken to hospital. They were diagnosed with severe malnutrition and a condition called shikorhe. This is a disease that's characterised by severe protein deficiency. It's a disease that is very rare in developed countries like Australia. It is a disease mostly found in developing countries with high rates of poverty and food scarcity. Poor sanitary conditions can also help set the stage for this form of malnutrition. And Kiwashaw can affect all age, people of all ages, but it's most common in children, especially between the age of three to five years. Caleb and Jonathan remained in hospital for two weeks. On the 1st of June 2020, the Queensland Attorney General requested the Queensland Family and Child Commission to commence a systems review into the policies and practices of relevant Queensland agencies who were involved <coughs> with Caleb and Jonathan mm. or those others who could have played a role in supporting the family. The review was to consider whether the performance and responses of those agencies in the lead up to the father's death were timely and effective, as well as identifying any gaps in service delivery. On 14 January 2021, the Queensland Family and Child Commission provided its report to the Queensland Attorney General. It reported on several systems issues that would benefit from further consideration by the responsible agencies, namely, the need to meet the safety and well-being of the needs of vulnerable children with disability during a health pandemic, strengthening pathways and guidelines to assist vulnerable families to engage with the NDIS, and overseeing and responding to children's engagement or lack thereof with supports funded under their NDIS plan. Commissioners, you will hear from Mr Luke Twyford the Principal Commissioner of the Queensland Family and Child Commission tomorrow about the review and the recommendations. Back to 2020. On 11 June 2020, the CEO of the National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIA, established a review of all relevant matters, including actions and interactions relating to Caleb and Jonathan's transfer into and time as NDIS participants. At the time of their father's death, Caleb was an NDIS participant. Jonathan was not. Paul Barrett was worried, quote, he would lose his carer's pension if he accessed NDIS funding for Jonathan. Jonathan is now an NDIS participant. The NDIA review was conducted between August 2020 and November 2020. And on 30 April 2021, the NDIA review report was finalised. The NDIA found that there were significant variances in the supports funded in Calab's three plans, 
largely due to his father's wishes. The review found the NDIA's processes did not appropriately support its staff to consider the appointment of a nominee for CALAB where he had not requested one, whether the father's continued appointment as CALAB's nominee remained appropriate, or how to manage the father's refusal to engage supports for CALAB. The NDIA acknowledged Mr Barrett experienced barriers, lodging a valid access request for Jonathan, and additional supports may have been beneficial. Issues were identified in relation to the NDIA's plan implementation, monitoring processes and procedures, and record keeping by the agency staff. While the NDIA staff worked efficiently and with the best of intentions to put in place NDIS plans for Caleb and Jonathan, after the death of their father, the review found that there was a lack of rigour with respect to identifying and engaging appropriately with authorised representatives. Commissioners, you will hear from NDIA representatives Dr Sam Bennett and Mr Desmond Lee tomorrow about the actions taken by the NDIA following the review and the responsibilities of the NDIA in ensuring a child or young person's wishes are ascertained and the child's best interests are of paramount consideration in actions and decision making. So I'll turn now to the approach that we'll take for this case study. This case study looks back to examine what happened to Caleb and Jonathan. Over the life of the Royal Commission, you have looked through the window of the lives of many people with disability at specific points or periods in time in their lives. You have examined specific incidents of violence and abuse. You have also, commissioners, examined systemic barriers experienced by people with disability. You have considered the effects on people's lives in segregated settings and the polished pathway. To some extent, this case study provides the opportunity to take a life course approach to examine Caleb and Jonathan's experiences from infancy, childhood, adolescence, and now as young men. Each person's life course is unique. However, patterns can be observed across groups of people who share common circumstances or experiences. The life course approach considers the timing of these influences, events or experiences in a person's life and how this affects them over the course of their life. Experiences that occur early in life or during key transition periods can have particularly significant impacts on life outcomes. The life course approach takes a long-term view of people's life stories, which reflect changing biological, social, environmental and historical influences. It can show how members of different generations are affected, as well as the intergenerational impact of these events over time. This approach assists in understanding how different influences affect the outcomes for individuals or groups over different stages of their lives. It helps in understanding the life pathways or trajectories of individuals or groups based on the impact of the biological, social, cultural and environmental influences. The life course approach recognises that all human lives are connected and interdependent. Each person's life outcomes are directly affected by different social networks and institutions and how they react within them. However, the approach also emphasises the inherent capacity of individuals to make decisions and choices about their own lives, including how to meet their needs and to reach their goals. For people with disability, this recognises their agency can be enhanced or restricted by the institutions or, and organisations they react with, community attitudes and certain policies and laws. A life course approach helps identify the risk factors for or the drivers of violence against 
and abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. <clears throat> Does this by identifying life influences that can increase the risk of people with disability experiencing maltreatment across the life course. Life influences are direct or indirect experiences or events that affect life pathways, trajectories and the outcomes of individuals. They can have positive or negative impacts on a person's life outcome. And a person's life influences may include personal characteristics such as their gender, race, culture, socioeconomic background. It may include their relationships, their interaction with institutions, services and supports, and laws, policies and broader community attitudes. This case study takes a life course approach. And I'll show you on the screen now uh, a diagram that uh, explains the life course approach. This diagram shows Caleb and Jonathan at the centre and then the layers or systems that worked around them, starting immediately with their parents and then moving to the broader community, being people who interacted with Caleb and Jonathan at their school and in their neighbourhood. The final layer being various Queensland and Commonwealth agencies that were involved in their lives at different times. As the final substantive hearing of the Royal Commission, we have also reflected on past hearings and the information the Royal Commission has received. In this final substantive hearing of the Royal Commission, we wanted to draw on what you've heard over the past four years to illustrate some of those recurring themes through Caleb and Jonathan's experiences. This hearing is intended to draw on the following themes from previous hearings. Themes concerning domestic and family violence. Themes concerning safe and suitable accommodation and homes. Access to healthcare in all stages of life early childhood education and special schools, accessing the NDIS and access to supports and services, communication and behaviour, the importance of independent advocates, attitudes and ableism, child and adult safeguarding, the importance of effective reviews and investigations, guardianship and supported decision making, human rights protections, the impact of COVID-19 and child protections. Commissioners, you recall at public hearing eight concerning the experiences of First Nations people with disability and their families in contact with the child protection systems held here in Brisbane from the 23rd to the 27th of November, 2020. At that hearing, you heard in some detail about the Queensland Child Protection Laws, Practices and Policies. And some of those policies were materially relevant to Caleb and Jonathan's lives, as are the themes that we have explored over the course of your hearings for four years. This case study by Looking Back has been prepared by the Royal Commission reviewing and examining many thousands of documents produced by Queensland departments and agencies, covering the whole of Caleb and Jonathan's lives since 2000. We have worked with the Queensland's represent legal representatives to agree on the facts that will be relevant to this case study. We have prepared a document with agreed facts set out with key events and incidents concerning Caleb and Jonathan's lives. We acknowledge the Queensland legal representatives agree that the facts, as far as they relate to, uh, are agreed only at this stage in principle. And Queensland reserves the opportunity to make further comments and submissions in relation to the agreed facts after council assisting submissions have been provided for this hearing. We acknowledge the uh, breadth and the depth of the work that has been involved in preparing this hearing, and we acknowledge Queensland's position. 
We thank their legal representatives for their cooperation in preparing for this hearing. Commissioners Caleb and Jonathan will not be giving evidence this week, but in the preparation of the hearing, we had the opportunity to meet them and visit them at their home. I have stressed and I will stress that they are at the centre of this hearing. So you will have the opportunity to hear from one of their friends, Lisa Hare, about how she got to know the family and the time she spent with Caleb and Jonathan. The documents produced by various Queensland departments and agencies reveal that both Caleb and Jonathan did not have the best start in their lives. Caleb was born in 2000, and as the agreed facts note, his mother had a previous history of engagement with child protection relating to her previous children. At the time of Caleb's birth, she lived with an intellectual impairment, anxiety and a depressive illness. And at the time of Caleb's birth, his parents' accommodation was described as, quote, questionable and unstable. Caleb was immediately identified as a child at risk of neglect. Support was offered to the parents through the residential early parenting service. But when Caleb was about three months old, he was removed from his parents and placed in foster care for about two years. The Queensland Department of Child Safety worked with the parents over that two year period that Caleb was in foster care. It was during this time Caleb was diagnosed with significant global developmental delay. And at the time, the records show that he was receiving appropriate therapy supports. In September 22, uh, Caleb was returned, sorry, September 2002, Caleb was returned to live with his father. On the day of Caleb's return, his father called a child safety officer, asking them to pick up Caleb. When the child safety officer attended, Mr Barrett was intoxicated and he said the mother had left him. Caleb was moved to a new location. In November 2002, the mother, who was then pregnant with Jonathan, attended hospital and waited in the maternity outpatient section with Caleb for over four hours. Mr Barrett later arrived intoxicated and his behaviour was described as, quote, highly er a highly erratic manner. When the security arrived, they tried to contain the situation. Mr Barrett began throwing punches and pushing at security. He began yelling and screaming. He was arrested and charged with behaving in a disorderly manner in a public place. But on 5 December 2002, he pleaded guilty to, a char to the charge and was convicted. In February 2003, a member of the community contacted the Department of Child Safety with concerns about the neglect of Caleb. The notification referred to the following. First, his father's alleged consumption of alcohol and drugs. Secondly, the physical presentation and hygiene of Caleb. Thirdly, Caleb's care. And fourth, the hygiene of the home. In response to the notification on 14 February 2003, a child safety officer assessed Caleb was, and I quote, not deemed at immediate risk of harm, but was, and I quote, a significant risk of future harm. The child safety officer rated the notification priority response one for 24 hours. In March 2003, Jonathan was born. Jonathan was later diagnosed with global developmental delay. By 2004, Paul Barrett was the sole carer of the two boys. The agreed facts then trace the boys' engagement with child safety, the health system, starting school and their attendance at a special school. Other than a seven-day period between 29 May and 4 June 2010, when Paul Barrett consented to the removal of Caleb, then turning 10, 
and Jonathan, then seven years old. They uh, otherwise remained in his care from the 4th of June 2010 onwards. They were dependent on him. Queensland government agencies had extensive engagement with the family. And over the period 1 June 2000 to 27 May 2020, the family had numerous interactions with Queensland government agencies. There were 35 occasions when Queensland received reports of or observed concerns for the children's diet, nutrition and access to food. There were 33 occasions when Queensland received reports or concerns observed about the father's drinking. There were 30 occasions when concerns about neglect were raised with or recorded by Queensland. There were 26 occasions when Queensland received reports of or observed concerns for Caleb and or Jonathan's hygiene. There were 21 occasions when Queensland received reports of or observed concerns about the father's aggressive or threatening behaviour. There were 21 occasions when Queensland received reports of or observed concerns about the father refusing assistance in relation to Caleb and or Jonathan's care. There were 19 child protection notifications made to the Department of Child Safety. There were seven occasions when Queensland received reports or information alleging family violence, either towards Caleb, Jonathan, the mother, and or a partner of the father. There were six SCAN meetings, SCAN referring to suspected child abuse and neglect. There were six occasions when Queensland received reports of unexplained injuries to Caleb and or Jonathan. And there were three occasions when the Department of Child Safety did a family risk evaluation and evaluated the family's risk as being, quote, very high. And three occasions where it assessed the family's risk as being high. Queensland, through its departments and agencies, were aware of the many risk factors exposing Caleb and Jonathan to violence, abuse, neglect, and a deprivation of their human rights. The agreed facts include reports and records of the following in relation to Caleb and Jonathan. Poor and inadequate living conditions, poor personal hygiene and toileting, poor diet or lack of food, poor physical condition or signs of harm or injury, lack of clothes or inappropriate clothing, lack of activities, lack of access to supports and services for their disabilities, lack of supervision, self-harming behaviour, lack of engagement and opportunities to engage with the broader community and a lack of independent advocates for Caleb and or Jonathan. Queensland, through its department and agencies, were aware of Paul Barrett's behaviours as reported, and these included the following. Lacking skill, or motivation to care for Caleb and or Jonathan. Failing to supervise or inadequately supervising Caleb and or Jonathan. Failing to ensure Caleb and or Jonathan attended scheduled medical appointments, including with paediatric specialists in relation to their development and with respect to Jonathan's seizures. Resisting or refusing assistance from government departments, agencies and support services to support the care of Caleb and Jonathan. Misleading government officers who on occasions accepted the father's assertions without verification. The father's behaviour generally and the aggression and threats to people who sought to support Caleb and or Jonathan his unstable interpersonal relationships and alcohol consumption. Commissioners, in the course of preparing this hearing, we also examined Mr Barrett's financial records for a four-year period prior to his death. He was unemployed and relied on government support. And Commissioners, you have in your materials an aid memoir that sets out the spending patterns, which reveal a very high level of cash withdrawals 
spending on alcohol, cigarettes and gambling. Commissioners, our assessment from the information reveals Queensland through its departments and agencies inappropriately focused on the efforts perceived to be made by the father and the circumstances of the father. There was no primacy given to the neglect, abuse and deprivation of rights that Caleb and Jonathan were subjected to. Their neglect was excused with statements such as the father is, quote, doing his very best. And the father was prioritised over Caleb and Jonathan's needs. The neglect of Caleb and Jonathan was often attributed to their disability. For example, it was reported Caleb and Jonathan, and I quote, do not like wearing shoes, but this is due to their disability and dislike for shoes. And to this extent, Queensland through its departments and agencies viewed Caleb and Jonathan through a lens of deficit and disability and not through a lens of what they could achieve. And you'll see from some current photos of Caleb and Jonathan, and they are now young men who wear shoes and clothes and engage beyond the lock room in which they were found. One of the issues arising in this case study is why Caleb and Jonathan's interests, needs and rights were not the paramount consideration. So commissioners, uh, we have received some statements and additional documents from Queensland yesterday. And we want to ensure that you have time to read these documents before you hear from the witnesses. So in terms of the programming for this public hearing, you'll hear from witnesses today and tomorrow morning. And then we propose that you consider adjourning after hearing from Dr. Bennett and Mr. Lee tomorrow to give you the opportunity to read through the witness statements provided by Queensland. And I think there may be a few more coming today. Then on Wednesday, you'll have the opportunity to hear from the Queensland government departments and their agencies. From Dr. Megan Crawford, Chief Practitioner of the Department of Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs. Dr Crawford has previously given evidence to the Royal Commission at Public Hearing 8 concerning the Queensland Child Protection System. You will also hear from Ms Hayley Stevenson, the Acting Assistant Director General, Disability, Inclusion and Student Services with the Department of Education. Also, you will hear from Ms Chantel Rain, from the Department of Communities, Housing and Digital Economy. Ms. Michelle Bullen from the Department of Seniors, Disability Services and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships will also give evidence. And the other witnesses will let you know when we receive the statements. Well, the next is the looking forward. This case study will also look forward to examine what has happened and whether the Queensland's relevance laws and policies are equipped to ensure that the type of violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of human rights that was experienced by Caleb and Jonathan will not occur again. You will hear today from Caleb and Jonathan's current service provider about their current accommodation, the services and supports they receive, their activities and their plans for the future. Alexis, which is a pseudonym, and her support team at Service Provider A, also a pseudonym, have supported Caleb and Jonathan following their father's death. And Alexis will tell you about their current circumstances. Alexis has provided some very recent photos of Caleb and Jonathan, and commissioners the photographs which are presently on the screen are of Caleb and Jonathan this year. One of the young men wears a clean grey singlet with black shorts and sand shoes, and the other young man wears a clean white t-shirt, blue shorts and sand shoes. They are both outdoors in a large park uh, with the treetops in the background, sorry, trees in the backdrop. It's a sunny day, the sky's blue. Commissioners, uh, Coming back to the circumstances in uh, 2020, on the 31st of March 2020, QCAT appointed a public guardian for Caleb 
and the public guardian makes decisions for K-Lab. Miss Smith will tell you about how her office has applied a human rights approach when making decisions for Caleb and Jonathan. The public guardian will also tell you about the circumstances in which Caleb's guardianship was appointed. And she'll also explain the circumstances in which she became uh, the guardian for Jonathan as well. The public trustee was also appointed to administer Caleb's and Jonathan's financial affairs. And then finally today, you'll hear from the Queensland Human Rights Commissioner, Mr Scott McDougall, about the operation of the Human Rights Act in Queensland, which commenced in January 2020. The obligations of public authorities to make decisions and act consistently with human rights is a feature of the Queensland Human Rights Act. Now, while this act was only in operation for a short period covering this case study, we want to ask Mr McDougall about what changes have occurred in Queensland in relation to public entities acting consistently with human rights in decision making. So Commissioners, for this finding, we will not ask the Royal Commission to make any adverse findings about any particular individual. Indeed, uh, many individuals are not named by their names and cannot be identified or refer to them for the most part by reference to their particular positions. But after hearing all of the evidence, we will ask the Royal Commission to consider making findings directed to three areas with respect to Queensland. Commissioners, Queensland's records, which form the basis of the agreed facts, should allow you to make the following findings directed to Queensland. First, we will submit it is open to you to find Caleb and Jonathan experienced violence, abuse, neglect and the deprivation of their rights while in their father's care between the 1st of June 2000 and the 27th of May 2020. Secondly, we will submit that the violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of human rights Caleb and Jonathan experienced was preventable. There is nothing about Caleb or Jonathan's age disability or their personal circumstances that made it inevitable that they should individually or together experience violence, abuse, neglect or a deprivation of their human rights. Queensland agencies and departments were aware of the risk factors from June 2000. Queensland was on notice of the risk of Caleb experiencing abuse and neglect. When Jonathan was born in March 2003, the risk of Caleb and Jonathan experiencing abuse and neglect only increased. Third, we will submit that having regard to the powers, responsibilities and actions of the Queensland departments and agencies that engage with the family, whether those Queensland departments and agencies could or should have acted to prevent the violence, abuse, neglect and the deprivation of their human rights. Commissioners, we may invite you to make specific findings in relation to particular departments and agencies. And this is why it's important that you have the opportunity to carefully consider the statements received from Queensland over the past day or so. Well, Commissioners, before we break, may I remind everyone following this proceeding be it in the room or on the web stream, that there are provisions in the Royal Commissions Act that have a very clear object of protecting witnesses who give evidence before the Royal Commission. In particular, I want to draw attention to Section 6, capital M of that Act, which provides that any person who causes, sorry, uses, causes or inflicts any violence, punishment, damage, loss or disadvantage to any person on account of the person having given evidence or information to the Royal Commission commits an offence. Commissioners, throughout this hearing, we will refer to the two young men, which are the focus of this hearing, by their pseudonyms, Caleb or Jonathan. Pseudonyms also apply to Alexis and Caleb and Jonathan's current NDIS service provider, which we will call Service Provider A. The Royal Commission has made directions prohibiting the publication of their names 
and identifying information in relation to this hearing. And if anyone has any uh, concerns or wishes any clarification about the nature and the operation of these non-publication orders, they should contact me or um, my colleagues in the Office of the Solicitor Assisting. Thank you, Commissioners. Commissioner McEwen, I think we were proposing to take uh, a short break of 15 and maybe 20 minutes before we resume. Thank you, Ms. Eastman. So it's, it's now 10 to 11. Shall we come back at 10 past 11? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you. We'll come back at 10 past, sorry, sorry, sorry 10, past, 10 past 11. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is in session. Ms. Eastman. Next, uh, well, our first witness for this hearing is Lisa Hare. And Commissioners, you have a statement provided by Ms. Hare dated the 20th of April 2023. And Ms. Hare is going to take a note. Thank you, Ms. Eastman. Before we do the oath, Ms. Hare, I just wanted to explain who, who we are. Firstly, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission. We're very grateful for you coming. I'm Commissioner McEwen. This is Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Ryan. So, again, we appreciate you coming. If you could just follow the instructions from the associate who will read the oath. Thank you. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Mr Eastman will now ask you some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McEwen. Uh, welcome, Ms Hare. Take a moment. So I just want to start by confirming that you are Lisa Hare. Yes. And you provided your address to the Royal Commission. Yes. And you made a statement which is dated the 20th of April 2023. Yes. And you've got a copy of the statement with you. Yes. And are the things that you've said in this statement all true and correct? Yes. I want to ask you some questions uh, about the matters in your statement and perhaps for parts of your evidence we might even read directly from your statement. Before we do that, some of the information you've provided to the Royal Commission in your statement uh, might be very distressing to people listening to the evidence. And I know it's also matters that have been very personally distressing to you from at different times. So if at any stage you feel you need to have a break or you just want a moment, please let us know. Yes. Okay, we're ready to start? Yes. So I want to uh, ask you about your time as the next door neighbour for Caleb and Jonathan. So we're focusing on that period of time. And you lived in the house next door. Yes. And you've lived in that house now for many years, is that right? Yes. And in the statement, you talk about your initial impressions when you first came to live in the house and you saw the next door house. And when you first moved in, you thought that the next door house, if I call it the family home, is that helpful, looked pretty normal from the outside. There was a boat in the front and a chicken coop out the back. And the outside of that family home was what you've described as a little bit funky. What yeah. do you mean by that? Dirty and messy. So dirty and messy. 
And you noticed that there was a, a blanket hanging downstairs. Yes, yes. Um, did that, the fact of the blanket sort of cause you to be thinking um, about it? It just anything? looked like it was hiding stuff under the house. Right. And one of the first things you noticed about your new neighbours was the noise coming from the house. Yeah, the boys. And you could often hear uh, two people who you now know as Jonathan and Caleb making noises. But their noises didn't sound like there was anything wrong or they were in pain, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So you heard your new neighbours, but you also saw Jonathan and Caleb outside in their yard from time to time. So I'm just looking at paragraph six of your statement. And what can you tell the Royal Commissioners about when you first saw them outside in their yard? And it was the early stages before you got to know them, but you, you saw well, them. Well, I have a 10-year-old son, so they looked about the same age. Um, but they were just wearing nappies. That's, and they, I could see that they were at least autistic or had some learning development issues. So when you first saw them in the uh, in the yard, you assumed that each of them were about the same age as your son, maybe about 10 years old? Yeah. And did you later find out how old they actually were? Yeah, about 17. Okay. And you, did you, you were a little bit surprised, weren't you, when you found Absolutely. out how old they were? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I think you could tell just from watching them that you assumed that they might be developmentally delayed. Did you try to have any contact with them or talk to them or do anything to communicate yeah, with just them? What did you from do? afar, like put a bubble machine on the back veranda. What and do let you the mean bubbles, by a bubble machine? Tell me like, how that works. <laughs> like it blows the bubbles out, lots of them, and just let the wind take the bubbles across so that they could catch them and play with them. I love that. Yeah. I love that a lot. Um, and waving to them and just looking to them and, yeah. So you just made that contact us by gestures to them? Yeah. And sharing the bubble machine with them. Then over time, uh, it might have been a few months, you then had a conversation with Caleb and Jonathan's person who you now know to be their father. And that first conversation was that uh, their father called out from across the fence and he asked you if you could pick up McDonald's for him. Yeah. Right? And you didn't have a car at the time, did you? No. no. And he offered to let you use his car, is yeah, that right? because he doesn't have a licence, so I could drive down to McDonald's. Right, so he didn't have a licence, yeah. but he had a car? Yes. You had a licence but didn't have a car? Yes. And so you were uh, happy to use his car to go and pick up some McDonald's, is that right? Yes. Okay. And after that, you and <coughs> Caleb and Jonathan's father got to talk to each other over the fence from time to time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, I want to come back to how you became friends and a good neighbour to Caleb and Jonathan. So can I ask you some questions about that? Yes. You got to know them uh, and you also got to know that they could only say a few words and I think that description, nonverbal, has been used to describe them. So you worked out a way of communicating with each of, um, and they're teenagers at this stage, aren't they? So yeah. each of the teenagers... How did you get Jonathan's attention? Um, tapping, hand tapping. He would always come up and I would just put my hands up like that and would just tap. Okay. And you just carry on conversation while he's tapping. Did you know whether uh, he used any sign language or had learnt any sign um, language? Do you remember his yes. father talking about yes. that? Yes, Paul said he knew sign language. I think this was more... And you just gestures for people who can't see you, just gesturing on your chin, is that yes. right? Yeah. And so what did the, uh, Jonathan's father tell you about using sign language? Um, just that he, he knew how to use sign language. I didn't know any, um, only the, the one thing for more and, yeah. Did you ever see uh, Jonathan's father use sign language to no. communicate with Jonathan or Caleb? No. 
Now, uh, let me ask you about communication and how you got to know Caleb. What, uh, what were the circumstances in which you were able to communicate with him? Um, loved the chickens. There were chickens and he loved the chickens and he'd say bok, bok, bok for the chickens. Um, think for a drink. Um, just always, I just used the same words that he used. And there, there were a couple of times uh, where he came over to your house, and I think and you talk about this later on in the statement that he stayed overnight. But when he did come over to your house at one time, you uh, thought about how were you going to communicate with him and make him feel comfortable in your house. And so you popped him up on the sofa. And what did you do for him when he visited on that time? I put chicken time? videos on the computer and he just loved it. He just sat there and just anything with chickens in it. And he sat there so I could do the dishes and I just stayed in the room. And, and I assume before you met Jonathan and Caleb that you hadn't yourself had any training or experience in communicating with young people with disability, is that right? No. I've and never particularly met. young no. people with yeah. the... Uh, nature of Caleb and Jonathan's disability and their limited communication, is that right? I've never met anyone with such severe disabilities. Michelle, could I just have the recording cut for a moment? I just want to point something out. Do you want? She's fidgeting the right way. She's identified. Just give me one minute. She's identified the way coming up on the screen. Is it this way? No. Okay, because it's coming up. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorted. Okay. So I think, um, and I don't know if we're back on. Thank you. So I think I was asking you that before you got to know Jonathan and Caleb, you hadn't had sort of any experience in looking at alternative forms of communication. No. But you had to work that out yeah. for yourself. Is that right? I just mimicked them in, in my own way with my own characteristics added. So you took a little bit of a lead from them because each of them were a little different in terms of their communication style. Is that right? It, it took Caleb a long time to trust. He didn't, he, he just stayed back. So I stayed back. And then as he began to trust me, then I stepped in a little more with him. Okay. And you weren't sort of with them all day, every day. You're, no. you're living next door. Yes. Yep. So sometimes you got to see them and then sometimes there might be a bit of a gap before you saw yes. them again. And when you did get to know both of them, you realised, and I'm just reading from your statement here, paragraph 11, you say, I realised that they were absolutely pure of heart. Jonathan is very cheeky. If he likes you, you will know because he would get very close to you and smile like his whole being was beaming at you. And he's eternally happy unless he's hungry. So that's your memory of yes. them. Now, dogs are pretty important in your life, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> and I think you've got uh, Lockie with you today. Yes. And when you got to know Jonathan and Caleb, you came to realise that actually they were quite fond of dogs as well. And you used to bring one of your dogs over to see both of the young men. And you remember that they both loved your dog. Yes. Oh, what is it about your dog that you remember that Azzy they love? Azzy is loved? very forgiving. She'll just, if it's got affection in it, she likes you. And um, is very standoffish. But when he trusted her, he just laid on her. And I'd never seen him do that before. Like he would play with her ears. and So Caleb just, would basically cuddle the dog, is that right? Yes, yeah. And your dog was quite relaxed and unfazed 
with oh, that level of absolutely. attention. Absolutely. And uh, one time, I think you remember the incident in the car and this that was when he just flopped yeah. over your yeah. dog. and Because as he was sitting between the two boys and woo, woo, both sides, they're doing that and she's completely unfazed and then she laid down on and laid down on top of her and he was just so relaxed. Okay. Now, I want to ask you a little bit about Caleb and you thought that he had lots of potential and when there were times when you were inside the next door neighbour's house, you had seen him come out of his room, get himself a glass of water if he was thirsty and there was one time when you had Caleb for a sleepover at your house. I think this was a time when Jonathan was in hospital because he'd had a seizure and you... Uh, hadn't had him stay over at your house beforehand and your son was also at the house as well? No. He wasn't? Okay. So when... I think the next day my son came home and they played ball together and I just didn't know that <laughs> had the social capacity to do that. Okay. So you, so you were able to see Caleb do a range of different activities and as you got to know him, you could see... In some ways, he could be independent. In some ways, he needed a lot of support. Yes. But that he could also make decisions about things like whether he wanted to play ball or some of the activities yes. that he did. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but you also saw on a number of occasions Caleb's father yell at him if Caleb, for example, wanted to get a drink of water. Yeah, and, and he lost confidence. He and felt Caleb lost confidence. He in lost himself. confidence in what he was doing. Okay. Can I turn now to ask you a little bit about what you saw inside the family home? So there were times where you did go into the family home. Yes. And the commissioners have seen a photo of some parts of the family home this morning in the opening. Can you tell the commissioners about what you can remember inside the family home and what it looked like? If you want to read from paragraph 16 of your statement or just have a look at what you've said at paragraph 16, if that helps you to describe the inside of the family home. Well, the lounge room was very bare. It just had boxes of nappies in the corner, um, a fold-out bed, um, with no mattress, a table, a very, very dirty table that had never been wiped down. Um, very dirty all over the walls and the doors. Um, piles of clothes that were mouldy and bugs on them in the bathroom. Um, the spoon on the door so that it could be... On the door. Um, there was no handle on the door to the room for the boys. It was just a spoon put in there so that Paul could open and close it from the outside. Okay. Can you remember uh, seeing anything about Caleb and Jonathan's bedroom? And I think you knew that they shared a bedroom, is that right? Yes, yeah. There and was what do you remember about <coughs> their bedroom? Just, just nothing in there except for a blow-up mattress. Did you ask their father why there wasn't any furniture in the boys' bedroom other than the blow-up mattress? Um, because of Jonathan's seizures. And did he explain to you why Jonathan's seizures was relevant to not having any furniture other than the blow-up mattress in the, the room? Because it, he would fall off the bed in a seizure and that would hurt him more, whereas if there's no furniture in the room, he would be on the floor already to have the seizure. And in terms of uh, the blow-up mattress in the bedroom, you remember seeing that the mattress was on the floor. Caleb and Jonathan didn't have pyjamas. No. There was no blanket no. even in winter. And that their father would take the mattress 
out each day, is that right? Clean the floor when the boys were at school and use lots of bleach and paint scraper to bleach the floors and sometimes the walls, is that right? Yes. And Caleb would have red legs because he would, and swollen legs from curling up to be warm in winter. You saw that yourself? Yes. Overall, you described the family home as not very clean and there was one time when you ended up scrubbing the walls with the broom yes. and you were also uh, had times where you would wash the dishes. Yes. And Paul paid you to do some of that cleaning work, did he? Yes. And when uh, you did that cleaning work, I mean, what did that involve for you? What sorts of cleaning um, did you have to do? There would be maggots in pots from being left with food in it. Um, just loads of dishes, lots and lots of dishes. Um, because when they came out of their room, they would have stuff on their hands, feces sort of or urine, mm -hmm. and they would touch as they went into the shower. So it was just everywhere. You weren't the only person who uh, provided some help around the house and you saw that uh, Caleb and Jonathan's father had some other friends who came and helped as well. Yes. So there was one person who bought chicken food for the chickens, is that right? Yes. And that friend helped look after the chickens? Yes. But I think you believe that uh, Paul Barrett didn't do very much around the house. He just enlisted other people to help yes. him. I want to ask you about Jonathan and Caleb and what happened when they were in their bedroom and you've dealt with this in the statement. You said there's one time that you saw their father open the door of the bedroom and that there was urine on the floor Caleb couldn't stand up and walk. His father was yelling at him to get out the door and go to the shower to get ready for school. And he saw that Caleb was slipping in the feces and urine. Given this description of the state of the boys' bedroom, you also tell the Royal Commission that when you were there, the boys would usually spend their time in their bedroom. Is that right? Yes, very long amounts of time. When they were in their bedroom, the door was locked? Yes. And it was up to their father to let them out? Yes. And uh, this is, explains the spoon in the door. Your memory is that Paul had taken the door handle off the door so they so the boys couldn't open the door, is that right? Yes. And he had the spoon on the outside of the door, which he used as a sort of makeshift handle, is that right? Yes. You saw what happened to Jonathan and Caleb in their bedroom because your kitchen window looked into their bedroom, is that right? Yes. And they didn't have any curtains or window coverings in the, their bedroom, did they? That's right. Even the fly screens, they'd peeled them off as well. Uh, I'm looking at paragraph 22 of your statement <coughs> and you say you could see when they were locked in their room and you saw on multiple occasions they were locked in their room for most of the day on a Saturday and Sunday. Yes. and during the week during school holidays. Yes. On a few occasions, they were locked in their room all day and into the night. And when they were locked in their bedroom, they were not able to access water, food or the toilet unless their father gave them access. Yes. Okay. And these are things that you could see through your kitchen window. Yes. And I could hear them. Well, there are quite a few times when you knew that uh, both Jonathan and Caleb were locked in their rooms for the day and you'd play relaxation music out loud so they could hear it. 
And sometimes you'd whistle through the window and Jonathan would whistle back. Yes. As you got to know Caleb and Jonathan, you started to care very much for them, didn't you? Absolutely. They're, they're just lovely. They're lovely. They're fun. I understood what trauma feels like and what it feels like to be abused. So I understood them. The ways in which you communicated them with them are through music, through gesture, and through the uh, things that you did. You did this because you felt that it would support them? Yes. Make them feel calm? Yeah. And as Knew far as possible, safe? That I loved them. <laughs> yeah. Like a mum. <laughs> Well, sometimes you felt like you almost had to be the mum for them, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. You also had an opportunity to see their father interact with them and his style of communication. And you've told the Royal Commission in the statement that Paul was often quite rough with the boys and on many occasions you saw him shove them in and out of the car and on occasions you also heard him yell at them and call them names. And you've given us a description of the name there. What does, what does that, how do you say that and what does that mean? Yeah, he just called them dickhead and fuckwood and just all kinds of names. Pull them around, push them around, yell at them. Did you ever uh, hear Paul describe the boys by their own names? No. I want to ask you now about care and supervision. So you were uh, aware of their morning routine, particularly when they were both at school and getting ready for school. And the morning routine would be that Paul would get the boys up in the morning, put them into the shower and turn it on. Yeah, and then leave them in there. All right, that's why I wanted to ask you whether, I was going to say, have we missed something in the paragraph here? But what, just put them in the shower and turn it on. Turn the shower on and the knobs were taken off and he would just turn it on and leave them in there. He didn't do any soaping or scrubbing. We've said in the statement that he would turn, that the gas was turned off so the shower water was cold even in winter. How do you know that? Um, I think he told me and he used um, a camping stove in the kitchen instead of the stove that's in the kitchen. He would use canisters to put on the camping stove. So he just basically turned the gas off. And you think that was because uh, he wanted to save money, is that right? <coughs> Okay, back to the morning routine. In the morning, Jonathan and Caleb's nappies were always full. Sometimes there would be feces on the floor of their bedroom because Jonathan had taken his nappy off overnight yes. and there were piles of soiled clothes festering in the corner. And I think you've said that earlier, that the clothes were covered in mould and had bugs. And Caleb's nappy would be so full that it would hang down to his knees and he would hold it to keep his dignity. The boys were always in a nappy and would only really have clothes on when they were going somewhere, coming back from somewhere or getting picked up for school in the morning. Is that yes. right? Now, throughout the statement, you've referred to some uh, aspects of Caleb and Jonathan's diet and the sorts of things they ate. But you said on three times you saw Paul give the boys an open cold can of casserole. Yes. And one time you saw their father give them sausages in a sealed packet that they couldn't open because he hadn't opened it for them. So yes. when you say they would sausage, never you would... open, they would never open any food that they were given. He, they had to give it to Paul to open and then it would be opened. Were these cooked or sausages? Or? Raw. Raw, raw sausages. They were outside with them. Outside? Yes. 
On another occasion, uh, their father told you to give Jonathan and Caleb a roast chicken that was in a bag that had been stored in the cupboard. Yes. And you saw a fly in the bag and you said to Paul that you didn't think it was appropriate to give the chicken to the boys because of the fly, but he told you to do it anyway. And did you no. agree you didn't do it? No, I left because he got angry and started being angry and mad with me and I just left. It was hard for you to leave, wasn't it, when you knew the boys were there? Yes. And they needed support? Always. I want to ask you about now another occasion where you did leave and you took Caleb and Jonathan with you. So not long after you'd moved into the house and you got to know the family next door, you went camping with Paul and the friend who fed the chickens. And Jonathan and Caleb. Yes. And during the day, you felt the tension rising between Paul and his friend. And you also noticed that Jonathan and Caleb were finding it hard to settle and to sleep. Yes. You remember that the boy's father and his friend got into a fight. Yes. And that caused you some distress. I just grabbed the boys and put them in the car and just drove off. You it's drove the, off. Yes, because it, it was all the chaos it would be very triggering for them and it just wasn't safe and the tension was rising and rising and rising. And, and what do you sense that both of the uh, boys, Caleb and Jonathan, were feeling very absolutely, anxious? Absolutely. Caleb was Caleb, fine. Caleb especially. You said to the Royal Commission in your statement that you felt that Caleb's sense of safety was ripped apart and you felt exactly the same. Yes. So you drove to KFC nearby, is that right? <coughs> yes. And you were in the car park. Yes. You were crying. Yes. And Caleb and Jonathan were also really upset. Yes. We just sat in silence. When we um, asked you to prepare a statement, we asked you to tell us if you could remember about support services that were provided in the house. And you've told us that a, a little earlier that you did some housework and cleaning and also you remember other people came in uh, who might have been the father's friends. Yes. But our question was outside the family or outside friends, what other support services were you aware of or did you see in the house? So I'm up to paragraph 30 of your statement and you said the father seemed averse to help, like respite or from other family yes. members because it meant that people would see how things were at home. And you said it seemed to me like he would only let people in the home that he trusted. Yes, yes, that he knew weren't part of the system that had been set up for support. What do you mean? Outside it? systems, government-funded yeah. systems. It seemed he would rather get support from random people around and people that had been he'd trusted and felt like were just his people, not, yeah, just his, who he wanted. So you remember that there were times when people who you don't know but you assume to be government service type people came to their house and it appeared uh, to you that when the services people came to the house that he knew what they might be looking for. Can you yes. explain that to me a little bit? Um, he did tell me at one point that if um, child services came, all you had to do was fill up your fridge. Um, also that the people at the school would write wash me under the arm 
of children to make sure that they're being washed. Um, he knew all the things to do that seemed like everything was okay. You remember two occasions when the Department of Housing came to do an in inspection, is yep. that right? And you thought it was surprising that they didn't enter the house on both times you saw them. Yes, very surprising that they didn't go inside the house. Do you feel, um, and this is just your opinion, that uh, Mr Barrett was trying to do what he could to ensure people didn't see what was happening inside the house? Absolutely, absolutely. Did you ever talk to him and try to encourage him to get some outside services? Yes. Like, why didn't he let the boys go with the mother and her take care of them? He said something about um, the grandmother had her house full of... Um, precious objects and that they would just destroy the house. Um, so he felt that it wasn't right for the boys to go there. Okay. One uh, issue the Royal Commission's looking at is who wraps around young people like Caleb and Jonathan, their support's in their immediate family, and then the supports from the people who know them and get to know them on a day-to-day -day basis. It may be schools or neighbours or other things. And one of the issues is how does the community or the neighbours become part of the eyes of making sure that we're safe in our houses, that we're connected with the community and that we know somebody's looking out for us? And we asked you about what you could recall about the safeguards in the community for Jonathan and Caleb. And you said this, can I read this? It's your paragraph 32. I believe Paul built a web of people around him and his relationships were very transactional. For example, he saw I was a good cook. I didn't have money to buy food at the time, but I could make food. So he would pay for the food and I would make it at my house and bring it over. I think he made friends with the workers at school so that would, that would come and help him when he needed. I saw a lady who would come on and off Jonathan and Caleb's school bus and came into the house. Sometimes she would pick their bags and help them get on the bus to school. I believe Paul knew he was not looking after Jonathan and Caleb properly because one time he freaked out when the painters came around and left a biohazard card in the door frame. Paul went into a panic, went straight into Caleb and Jonathan's bedroom and started cleaning it. He was really freaked out. So that you've told the Royal Commission about those memories of safeguards in the community. Is there anything else that you want to say about the safeguards in the community? No. I think it just, yeah, it was hard to get in there. You also uh, had the opportunity, as you've told us during your evidence today, of seeing Mr Barrett's interaction with his own children. But you also know that he had his own troubles and demons, didn't he? Yes. He was abused. You knew he was drinking? Yes. And you believe he drank every day? Yes. And, and smoked marijuana. And I think some other things that I'm not sure about. Yeah. And in terms of the drinking, you saw that he'd usually have a minimum of two casts of port a day. And if you saw him in the afternoon, you didn't know what to expect and this contributed to his moods being so unpredictable. Yes. There were times where he could be calm and then it could switch quickly to yelling and ranting. Yes. And that this was often when Caleb and Jonathan were at home. Yes. 
you had deep concerns about Caleb and Jonathan, but you were also concerned about Mr Barrett's health and welfare as well, weren't you? Yes. I think um, he said he had diabetes because I said a saw wasn't healing on his foot and he went and got checked for diabetes. But there came a point in time where you just could not assist and support that family as well as supporting yourself and your own family. Is that right? Yes, it was too overwhelming. So you remained being neighbours, but you started to pull back a little bit from what you could do to support the next door family. Is that right? Yes. Uh, tell me if it's okay to go to this next topic, which is Mr Barrett's death. You yes. okay if I ask you some questions about that? You remember that day on Wednesday, the 27th of May, 2020? Yes. Uh, at, this was a, a time where Australia was experiencing the beginning of what we now know to be the COVID pandemic. Yes. You recall the police knocking on your door? Yes. And they told you Paul had passed away? Yes. And you were shocked? Absolutely. You had seen the police and the ambulance outside the family home that morning? Yes. And you thought that maybe Jonathan had had a seizure? Yes. The day after Mr Barrett's death, a journalist contacted you at your home at 7am in the morning? Yes. Now, I assume we're right in understanding that in your life you haven't spent a lot of time contacting and speaking to journalists, particularly in the early hours of the morning. No. <laughs> the journalist came to your house asking about what you knew from next door. Yes. That made you feel very uncomfortable. Yes. Later that morning, someone else from another media outlet contacted you and also asked you about what had happened next door. Yes, and they were camped out the front, parked in cars. Out the front of your house? Yes. You provided uh, a journalist with a copy of some footage, so a recording that you had made from your property of uh, Jonathan and Caleb in their bedroom and you did an interview. Yes. You wanted everyone to know how the boys had been living. Absolutely. You felt that you had witnessed what had happened to Jonathan and Caleb during your time as their neighbour and you felt it was right that what happened to them be brought to public attention. Yes, because they couldn't say, they couldn't. So, as you know, Caleb and Jonathan then moved from where they were living. Yes. And you haven't been able to have an ongoing <coughs> contact or relationship with them. No. <laughs> and that's also a really distressing thing for you as well. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of like the end of the story that hasn't happened. Mm. Thank you for giving the Royal Commission such a comprehensive statement. I know it's been very difficult for you to tell the story. Is there anything I've forgotten to ask you or cover or anything that you would like to tell the commissioners? Um, I just hope the boys have a really wonderful life from here on in because they definitely deserve it. Ms. Hare, thank you very much for uh, sharing your time being a neighbour and friend to Caleb and Jonathan. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen. Thank you, Ms. Eastman. Ms. Hare, thank you. If it's okay with you, I'll ask my colleagues if they may have some questions for you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Macy. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Ms. Hare, for. <coughs> coming today and giving evidence 
and then what you heard and saw with the boys. Um, and also your best wishes for the boys as well. So thank you very much. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, just a couple of little things. By the description you've given of the house, did it smell bad when you walked through the door? Would that have told people as you walked into it that there was something wrong? I actually don't have any sense of smell. <laughs> so I couldn't smell it. Okay. But his friends had said, can't you smell that? And I said, no. The other thing is you report that some people from the school went into the house from time to time. One, yes. You're one sure they went into the, the house? Yes. And they into would have seen room. what you saw? No, because the door would have been closed to the boys' bedroom. <clears throat> it would have been closed. They would have gone just either into the living room. Would they have seen the kitchen? Possibly, yes. Yes. And what made you think they were from the school? Uh, they got off the school bus because um, of Jonathan's seizures. He had to have someone ride on the school bus in case he had a seizure. So the same worker that worked at the school would turn up in the morning for the school bus to get on the bus with them. And they'd come in the afternoon and get off the bus and get in their car to go home. You talked about some painters. Did they go into the house too? No. Right. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hare. I'll check with Ms. Eastman. Do any of the parties with leave to appear, do they have any questions? Uh, none of the parties with leave to appear have raised with me the wish to ask any questions of Ms. Hare. No, thank you. Ms. Hare, thank you very much for your willingness to come and give your account of what you saw and heard, and we very much appreciate your assistance to uh, our work of the commission. Thank you. You may be excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner McEwen. Uh, we're making good time, uh, so if we could adjourn for the lunch break now and resume at 1.30 p.m. Right. Thank you, Ms. Eastman. So we will come back at half past one. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Uh, thank you. Before we go any further, I just want to uh, remind everyone here in the Brisbane hearing room and those who are watching uh, this hearing over the live stream that there are non-publication and pseudonym directions which apply to certain evidence. The two young men who are the focus of this hearing are referred to pseudonyms Caleb and Jonathan. Pseudonyms also apply to Alexis and Caleb and Jonathan, current NDIS service provider, which we call service provider A. The Royal Commission has made direction prohibiting the publication of their name and identifying inf information in relation to this hearing. Thank you. Ms. Eastman. Thank you, Commissioner McEwen. Our next witness is uh, Alexis. As you've just identified, she's using a pseudonym and she's giving evidence on behalf of service provider A. And Alexis is here in the hearing room and I understand she'll take an oath. Um, Alexis, uh, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission and the Commissioners are very grateful for your contribution. I'm Commissioner McEwen, which is Commissioner Mason, and Commissioner Ryan. I will ask uh, the associate to please read out who will administer the um, oath to you. Thank you. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. 
Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Ms. Eastman. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Alexis. Uh, you've provided your name and your professional working address to the Royal Commission, that's right? Yes. And we're using the pseudonym Alexis today. Yes. Commissioners, you have in the background material in preparation for Alexis's evidence an outline of the topics that we'll cover today. And you also have the two uh, statements provided by Service Provider A in response to notices issued by the Royal Commission. Those two statements set out for Caleb and Jonathan, respectively, the services provided by Service Provider A to each of them. And those are some of the topics that I'll cover with Alexis now. So, Alexis, can I start? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role with Service Provider A? Yes. So, I am the Care Services Coordinator for Service Provider A, um, and we provide 24-7 supports for Caleb and Jonathan uh, in their current home. And I've been in this role for coming up to a year, working very closely with Caleb and Jonathan and supporting them um, to both reach milestones within their individual development and plans. Um, and yeah, we've been providing supports for Caleb and Jonathan coming up three years um, toward the end of this year. Um, and again, I've known them since starting this role and I meet with both Caleb and Jonathan quite frequently. Okay. Now, you've got a copy of the statements that have been provided earlier. Yes. And that was in a response to a notice provided, sorry, given by the Royal Commission to tell the Royal Commission about the nature of the services provided to Caleb and yes. Jonathan. So you've got a copy with yes, you? Yes, I do. And if, as I'm asking you any questions or topics you need to refer to mm -hmm. those statements, feel free to have yep. reference to them or read from them if you wish. So I want to start with the living arrangements for both Caleb and Jonathan. We're speaking about them together because they live together. So can you give me a description of Caleb and Jonathan's current living arrangements? Yes, so they are in a Department of Housing home, um, sharing that home together. They are three bedrooms. Um, they both have their own separate, quite decently sized bedroom. Uh, and then there is a third bedroom there for the staff member as well. Um, they both have their own single beds, uh, mattress, bed frames, uh, adequate linen, quilts, pillows. Uh, both have a wardrobe as well, full of clothes, shoes, um, you know, additional blankets uh, and such. Um, they do also keep some of their favourite toys with them, usually during the day and also at night with them as well when they are asleep uh, in their room. They uh, have uh, Can lovely... I just ask you to oh, sorry. slow down just, a, sorry. Little, just yes. a little bit? <laughs> yes, sorry about that. Um, so they have a uh, large... Uh, lounge room as well that they like to watch TV. They do have a wall-mounted television as well in the room. Uh, they have a bookshelf, um, table and chairs for them to use. Um, they have a kitchen space as well with a dining table and chairs that they eat every meal at uh, during the day. Um, we are also in the process of getting them new couches so they can have one each to use during the day with the staff. And we are also working on getting some uh, light-up music players for them as well because they do really enjoy listening to music. Um, the property does also have a large backyard that they tend to go on out to on a daily basis. There is a swing set that Caleb really enjoys using and there is a, an enclosed, uh, enclosed trampoline that Jonathan tends to use more uh, with the staff as well. So just about the, the backyard. Yes. Um, you may not be, you might be like me, I'm not so good at exactly the measurements of it. But when we think about a backyard, mm. what sort of dimensions are we oh. talking about in terms of the space? It's enough to fit a swing yeah. set and, uh, and a trampoline. Mm. But does it have grass and trees? And yes. What, what does it Yeah, there's like? a quite, so the, the trampoline and the swing set are toward the back of the space. There is a quite a large grass area as well as you come down the stairs. Um, so yeah, there is a large grass space and a couple of trees in the backyard as well. 
And how, how much worry. time would they spend either inside the house or outside the house? Because oh. I'm going to ask you about some of their activities in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, they spend a lot of time in the backyard as much as they can. Um, Caleb does ask quite a lot to go down to the backyard. Uh, he loves his swing. Um, so they, they're taken out there quite often during the day with the staff, yeah. Are they at a point where they can decide themselves independently to go and use the backyard and just yep. come and go or do they have to ask permission to go in and out of the we, house? Uh, Caleb asks um, to go out there frequently. Uh, Jonathan will usually, he's taken my hand or he takes the staff member's <laughs> hands and will show them to the back door when they do want to go downstairs to the backyard. Uh, Caleb is allowed time on his own in the backyard if he wishes just so they have, you know, their own time um, in the house, yeah. Right. Now, in terms of it in the house mm. and how they uh, move around the house, the Royal Commission has heard a little earlier today about the circumstances mm. of their previous home and the extent to which they were able to move around that house or not. Yep. In this house, they each have their own bedroom. Yes. And you've said there's a lounge room and a mm -hmm. kitchen and quite a lot of furniture, it sounds yep. like, in the house. Yeah. So in terms of moving around the house, it, can you give us a sense of how they use the house, how they, they interact in the house with each other and yeah, with the support Yeah, workers? they they constantly are moving freely about the space to their rooms, um, through the kitchen and lounge room. Um, if they want to sit down and have a rest, they'll go and have a rest on the couch with the staff and just watch TV. Um, they, if they want to go to their own rooms, they will. They will shut the door themselves and have you know, their own private time, their own space, um, so they move freely about the house constantly. So they can decide within the house where they go yeah. and what they do yep. within the house. Definitely, yeah. All right. Can I turn to uh, one bit of, of what we've heard about using bathrooms, showering and mm. toileting? What are the arrangements in the house yep. around bathroom, toileting, showers, yep. and how are they using that space? Is that mm. something they can do independently? Yeah, yeah, they, they've been working on that uh, quite a lot recently. Um, they, do, they do still have a schedule where they are taken to the bathroom throughout the day. It's usually when they wake up, before or after lunch, and then in the evenings as well. They, Caleb does take himself to the bathroom now. Um, he will still require assistance from staff, you know, with the pad changes um, and then potentially getting changed after as well. Jonathan does need a bit more assistance with that still, um, but he's still kept on that schedule throughout the day with his toileting. Okay. I want to ask you now about the types of supports that are provided to each of Caleb and Jonathan. And in paragraph two of the respective statements provided to the Royal Commission earlier this year, we asked you and you responded by telling us about the types of supports your service provider, service provider A, provides. Um, we understand that the supports are provided on a one-to-one -one basis from 6 a.m. in the morning through to 10 p.m. at night and then support on a two-to-one basis for overnights and during the evenings. So that tells us a little bit about when the mm. supports are in place, but what can you tell us about the type of supports and services yep. provided to Caleb and to Jonathan? Yep. So we do help them um, with quite a lot throughout the day and the evenings as well. Um, so we support them with their meal preparation, uh, their personal cares, uh, again, toileting, sharing, washing, uh, toilet brushing, personal grooming, um, medication assistance, uh, any tasks that they need assistance with fine or gross motor skills, um, general supervision throughout the day mostly, um, cleaning of the house that they cannot assist with, like mopping, vacuuming. Uh, community access is a big one that we assist with uh, daily. They do require assistance with personal banking as well. Um, being taken to any medical or allied health appointments that may be arranged for them, shopping and then supports around any escalating behaviours throughout the day or evening as well. Do they do any chores themselves around the house? They do, yeah. Do More do? Caleb has been helping, mm -hmm. so he has been helping the staff and the staff have been really good at encouraging him to help take the bins out on a daily basis. 
Uh, Caleb also will put away his clothes, put away his toys, and also they both, after a meal or after a drink, will put their dirty dishes in the sink as well um, and just get encouragement around helping where they can, yeah. In terms of the supports that are provided, are part of those supports assisting both Caleb and Jonathan to build their skills mm. and to uh, give them choice and control yep. in the activities that they do yep. in the house mm. and choice and control over the services that they need. So there's a little bit of three questions in one there. Yep. So the main way that we offer them the choice and control is their daily activities um, and asking them, you know, can you help wash today and things like that and learning, helping them learn new skills as well. For instance, that taking the bins out, that's a new skill that Caleb's been learning. Also asking if they do want to go to the park, to the backyard, do they want to try a new park as well? Um, so that's the biggest way that we can offer that. Yeah. Also, uh, they can pick out their clothes from their wardrobe as well, uh, their shoes when they want to go to the park or backyard. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I might just deal with that topic of mm. clothing now yep. before I come back and ask you about uh, diet and mm -hmm. food in the house. Yeah. In terms of clothing, you've uh, provided us some photographs, which we showed the commissioners this morning. Mm. Uh, of each of them just from a view from the back yep. and they had their shorts and T-shirts on yep. and socks and shoes. Mm -hmm. Now, one uh, thing we've seen in the course of reviewing the material is a suggestion that because both of them live with disability, they don't like or they don't wear shoes. Now, I don't know whether service provider A was aware of that statement being made before you took on uh, supporting Caleb and Jonathan, but you can tell us something about their relationship with shoes, yeah. can't you? Yes, right. yeah. So tell me about about shoes and how they like their shoes yes. and what the arrangements are, but also the shoes are part of, mm. of learning independence. It is, is yeah. that right? What yes. can you tell us about that? Yeah, we yeah, we didn't know about that statement before taking them on. Um I mean, like a lot of people, they don't necessarily wear the shoes in their own home, um, but they do, they have known that, you know, when we go to the backyard or when we go to a park or on community access, they know to go and collect their shoes. Um, I've seen the staff and myself, you know, let's, time to go out, let's go get our shoes, and they both can go to their room, find their shoes, um, and, yeah, they, they can also pick out clothes as well if they want to pick out clothes for the day, yeah. Uh We've also heard a little bit of the evidence earlier today that when in their former home, if they were at home, they didn't wear clothes that much. Uh, they would only wear clothes if they were going to school or going mm. out. So at home now, what's the arrangement? Yeah, Do they wear clothes at home? Yes, yeah, they're in clothes every day. Yeah. And they each choose what they would like to wear? Yeah, if they want to. Some days they might not want to, and so the staff will assist with that, but they both um, will can go and pick out from their wardrobes what they want to wear for the day um, and just go pick a shirt or shorts, yeah. I want to turn to the topic of their uh, diets mm -hmm. and the consumption of food. The Royal Commissioners are aware from the documents that are available and what's been recorded in the agreed facts that there have been occasions where each of the young men, Caleb and Jonathan, would eat non-food items, uh, have um, an appetite for food mm. that may be described by some as insatiable, so limited control over the yep. amount of food that they eat. And we've also heard a description from one of the neighbours today about the quality or the standard mm. of that food. So when uh, service provider A came to provide services to uh, Caleb and Jonathan, that followed a period of time where they had been admitted to hospital with severe malnutrition mm. and associated health problems flowing from that. Yep. Are we right in understanding that managing and supporting both Caleb and Jonathan in relation to their diet and food consumption is a very important uh, area of support yep. 
for, for services, is yep. that right? Definitely, yeah. And what did you know about the condition of Caleb and Jonathan other than that period of time that they had spent in hospital being treated mm. for a very severe disease concerning malnutrition? Did you, did you know much? Not a lot. About their previous diet no. or any information? Look, about and that? We knew it was poor, but mm. didn't know that much about it, yeah. The photos that we saw today, yeah. uh, at least from the back, mm. don't look like the types of images that you associate with the type of malnutrition mm. and the disease that yep. they were both suffering. Yep. So, what can you tell us about the way in which they're both supported in their diet, their nutrition? but also the structure and regulation around um, eating mm. meals and things like that. Yep. I think you've just said earlier that they eat their meals yes. three times a day. Yes. But can you tell us sort of what the process has yep. been in supporting them? Yeah, yeah. Um, they've yeah certainly come a long way um, with regards to their meals. So we we do all the meal preparation for them, uh, any, any hot Meals such as dinners are cooked at night when they are asleep because they just don't have that awareness around safety in the kitchen. Um, but, yeah, the staff prepare their breakfasts, lunches. They have uh, fruit and snacks often. Um, Caleb will often ask for a cookie or tea. And so, yeah, we obviously help him with that. Um, they do... Uh, get seen by a dietitian as well who's been really involved with coming up with meal plans um, to help with their nutrition and they've just even seeing how much they've grown um, in height wise and weight wise has been yeah amazing seeing that yeah. Uh, are they at a stage where they're able to contribute to making choices about the food that they eat? Yes, some. Uh, Caleb, again, he will ask for snacks often. They, uh, Caleb can ask for water, drink, tea. He loves teas in the evenings, uh, cookies, snacks. So he, he can certainly ask for that. If they have a choice of fruit for a snack, they can take what they want, take the option that they feel like. Yeah. For Jonathan, there's still some challenges for, for him that he's yes. experiencing mm. in terms of uh, regulating his intake of yep. food, but also non-food yep. items. Yeah. What what supports is Jonathan mm. receiving in relation to uh, those sorts of challenges? Yeah. So the the staff def definitely focus on uh, portion control because yeah they would eat as much as they can uh, if they could. Um, Jonathan do, does still daily explain. Um, display the behaviours of consuming non-edible items. If they're on a walk or in the backyard, he may try and pick up a small stick or leaf um, and try and eat that. He does not often, but he still will pick at his continence aid as well. Um, so he does still try and consume that. So working on that is mainly the supervision of the staff, which is really important. Um, he is getting a lot better at listening to staff instructions if he's asked to take it out of his mouth or spit it out or something like that. He he often will. So he's improving in that way, but he still does display those behaviours. And and as um, service provider A and you and the support workers have worked, supported the two young men, have their behaviours in relation to eating and consumption being understood as a form of communication as well? Communication in the sense of the sensory way in which mm. they experience the world, but also forms of communication in terms of being able to tell the support workers how they're feeling or what what they might need at a particular moment in time. Have you looked at that relationship between the behaviours around food mm. and forms of communication? We're looking in that into that at the moment, actually. So with... Um, bringing on a new occupational therapist for them. She is looking at that behaviour with the food seeking and how we can maybe find something to replace that behaviour, uh, such as like the edible toys and things like that. I don't know before my me stepping into this role if it was looked at, but I know we are looking at that um, at the moment, yeah. Okay. I want to ask you uh, about moving from inside the house and the garden to access to the community and broader activities. Mm -hmm. And the Royal Commission has heard 
uh, this morning, for example, that perhaps on some occasions on weekends and school holidays when they were both at school, that they would be confined to their bedroom. And uh, one of the questions I think we were keen to understand is, has the change in their living circumstances also provided a change to the community that wraps around them? And by that I mean that where do they fit into their local community? What engagement do they have with their local community and their level of participation? So we asked you yeah. about that in preparing for the hearing. So you've addressed that in your statement and I know you've written some notes yep. to remind you about what you wanted to tell me around mm. access to the community mm. and activities. Yep. So what's the situation at the present time? So we do, we put a... A staff car in place at the home as well so they do have constant access to be able to access the community. They do go out on a daily basis uh, whether it be they do have a local park. Um, I worked with the staff to come up with a list of new places as well for them to visit which they have been taking them to um, in surrounding suburbs. Um, and so, yeah, they have gone to waterfronts, they enjoy bushwalks, barbecues with the staff. Um, that probably is the main way that they are fitting into the community at the moment, just with Jonathan's behaviours and the food-seeking uh, behaviours as well. He may go up to other people's barbecues and, yeah, try and access that. So one question might be that looking at the, their life course journey and uh, we understand that they went to school at, special, at mm. a special school, it's difficult to see that they develop friendship or had friendship groups or connections with mm. aged peer friends while they were at school. Like they may or they may not yeah. have. But they've now both left school. Neither of them are in any type of employment. Mm. And as I understand it, they're not at a stage where even considering employment in an Australian disability enterprise is an option at this stage. What supports do they have to build relationships with aged peers or, or to participate more broadly in the community with other people yep. as opposed to going to different locations? Is that something that uh, service provider A is working with them under their plans to, to provide supports? And if so, you know, how are you doing that? Yeah. The main way, so I am trying to look into potentially a day program or service for Caleb. I believe he could be close to that point to have that or even have a day service come to their home as well could be an option. Um, working with their allied health, having the visits from the behaviourists, the OTs, which is going to start soon, it may be hard for them to hold down a job in the future, um, but I feel they could work toward a day program, continuing with frequent supports and, yeah, so they need, growing. So they will need support to develop the skills and be supported yes. in the skills to be able to participate yeah. in environments where they can engage with aged peers. Mm, yes. But at the present time, their uh, lives are essentially with each other as brothers. Yes. And I think... Sometimes they get on each other's nerves. Yes, they can, yeah. Uh, but uh, other than that, most of their life is surrounded by adults. Yeah. And people supporting them or uh, checking on them yeah. or monitoring in them in some way. So yes. that's pretty much yes. their life at the present time. Mm -hmm. okay. I want to ask you about uh, supports in relation to their health and that's the medical and therapeutic supports. The, uh, each of them have particular and separate health requirements. So it's not a one-size-fits-all in mm. terms of the therapeutic supports they require. But what does the service provider do in terms of the support in relation to engaging with health systems? Uh, so... Uh, my role is a lot of liaising with the supports and booking appointments and follow-ups as they're needed. Uh, Caleb 
does have his regular or access if he needs it to his GP. He will start um, more visits with his OT when that plan comes through and he does have fortnightly visits from his behaviourist as well. Um, he also gets uh, about fortnightly to monthly support from his dietitian um, and then he is assessed annually by the autism specialist as well. Um, Jonathan is also has access to his GP as required. Uh, he does receive um, support, yeah, again, fortnight to about monthly from the OT when that starts, as well as the dietitian. Um, and then he, they both do have visits from a speech therapist as well to work on that communication and infrequent supports from the psychologist and behaviourist for Jonathan. And they both presently have the public guardian appointed. Yes. And one of the responsibilities of the guardian is also to assist and support them to make decisions around the health issues. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So part of your role in supporting them on the health and therapeutic supports, does that involve liaising with the guardian from time to time? Yes, it does, yeah. And uh, beyond the decisions around health issues, what other arrangements are there in place with the public guardian, who we're going to hear from very shortly? Yeah. But, uh, from your experience, uh, what's the nature of the relationship between the public guardian and the service provider in supporting both Caleb and Jonathan? Yeah, I am in touch with them uh, both quite frequently. Um, you know, they do check in um, just to see how they're going, uh, any plan reviews um, type things as well. They'll, yeah, just call, check in and see how they are, yeah. Okay. Next question I wanted to ask you is about restrictive practices, and that's a topic that the Royal Commission has heard a lot about in the course of its work over the past few years and how restrictive practices can often limit a person's rights. And then we've heard a lot about the regulation of restrictive practices and the obligation of service providers to report restrictive practices. We're aware, and I'll ask uh, the public guardian about this shortly, that when the QCAP made orders with respect to the guardianship arrangements mm. for both Caleb and Jonathan, Though that included uh, some authorisation in relation to restrictive practices. Yes. Service provider A, as a registered service provider of the NDIS, also has particular obligations around restrictive practices. Yes. Uh, is the Royal Commission right in understanding that in supporting both Caleb and Jonathan, there have been occasions where there needs to be restrictive practices in operation? Yes. All right, what can you tell us about the practice that the service provider uses in relation to restrictive practices yep. and the approach to restrictive practices for both Caleb and Jonathan? Yep. So the approved restrictive practice is the locking of the pantry door, which is approved for Jonathan. Caleb did have that uh, in his plan, but we were able to remove that as he improved in the way he didn't need to access the pantry and he... What did, so can I jump in? Sorry. There? When yeah. you say he improved in a way... Yeah. Can you spell out what those improvements were and how those improvements got to a point where the restrictive practice was not necessary? I think he, it was, he learned, you know, to either ask for something from the pantry and he learned to listen to the staff um, maybe when he did try to access it. So he just, yeah, he learned not to access it, basically, for Caleb, yeah. So with the behavioural change mm. and working with the support workers, yep. that just accessing the pantry without any sort of moderation yep. or restraint, mm. that's no longer his behaviour. Yes. And as a result, the restrictive practice is not in place? Yes, correct, yeah. Jonathan's in a slightly different situation. Yes. And what's the situation with Jonathan yep. and restrictive practices in relation mm. to the pantry? Yeah, so it is still approved uh, in Jonathan's plan. Um, at the moment, again, he's really improved with not wanting to access the pantry and he has also learned maybe not to or 
and we don't really ever need to lock it anymore as well, which is a really good improvement. Um, and they know yet to ask for something. Jonathan will maybe try and access the fridge now, but not so much the pantry yet. Okay. Are there any other restrictive practices that are in place? No. I want to then turn to the future, and I said in making some opening remarks to the Royal Commissioners this morning that part of this case study is to examine a life course, and a life course allows us to look at different points in time in people's lives, and in effect sometimes the sliding door moments where the decisions that are made might uh, take people down one pathway or other. So at the present time, are we right in understanding that it's likely that service provider A will continue to provide services in accommodation and the broader supports that you've talked about yes. indefinitely? Yes. And uh, the nature of those services are likely to change over time? Yes. Yep. And I think you've... Uh, being clear about the services, building mm. choice and control, building independence, and to build a life of independent living. That's very much the goal. Yes, yeah, definitely. Right. At the present time, uh, it's unlikely that they will ever be able to live wholly independently, mm. but who knows what the future holds. Exactly, yeah. In terms of thinking about their short-term, medium and long-term goals, about their lives, their participation in the community and what may be ahead of them in the future, we'd like to be able to ask them. But I wanted to ask you from the perspective of a service provider and your role in supporting them, is there anything you want to tell the Royal Commission about mm. your sense of the future for them yep. based on knowing them yep. uh, and based on supporting them and whether, you know, there'll be a point in time where exercising dignity of risk will be something open to them without mm. the fear of injury yep. or some adverse outcomes? Yep. What would you like to tell the Royal Commission yep. about the future? So even just working with them both in the year that I've been their coordinator, um, myself and their team have witnessed them um, grow uh, and reach goals. So continuing their growth with their independence within their daily lives. Um, the, the staff there continue to encourage them both to assist where they can um, in their daily routines uh, around the house, as I mentioned before, taking on new duties and being able to help take the bins out, for example, um, and putting away the toys. The staff encourage Jonathan and Caleb to, again, participate in their personal cares, um, washing their faces, washing their hands, you know, taking the washer from the staff and washing them in the showers. And uh, Caleb continues to work on his vocabulary and just continues to progress in picking up new words that the staff um, staff maybe pick a few certain words to help Caleb learn. Um, he's been getting really good at even saying my name, which is great. Um, and that's, I feel like it's a very significant milestone for him to continue to pick up new words and phrases so he can grow in the way of communication with the staff, with myself, um, which has been really good um, for him to learn. Um, Jonathan, his communication is progressing but definitely in a different way to Caleb. So he will use hand gestures. Um, so we have put up uh, like laminated pictures of certain sign uh, gestures for the staff. They've been there for quite a while in the house so the staff can uh, continue to use them with Jonathan and he does know a few of them and the staff will keep continuing to help Jonathan pick those up so he can communicate that way as he may not be able to verbally communicate with the staff. Um, again, uh, they have been engaged with a new OT who's working on uh, developing new activities, um, sensory items, uh, and they will be structured into their daily routine. So we're working on a, um, a better daily routine for them that's a bit more structured to implement those sensory games and activities for them both. Um, 
so that will hopefully take away those maybe those food seeking behaviors from Jonathan and refocus them elsewhere um, and also build up their gross and fine motor skills um, and those I believe having those activities will also help with their independence as well um, and pick up new new skills and tasks um, and to continue ensuring that we give them as much choice and control as possible. Um, the staff and myself will ask what they want to do on a daily basis, what they want to eat, if they want to drink, what drink they might like, um, again, what they might want to wear, and again, if they have some activities they might want to do. Um, and we take the staff and myself will take guidance from them. Again, if sorry, Jonathan might take my hand and show me to the back uh, backyard or I know Caleb often asks to go to the park so we follow um, their instruction uh, with that on a daily basis yeah well thank you very much for answering my questions and uh, I hope I haven't overlooked anything but the commissioners might have some questions for you thank you Alexis um, Alexis thank you uh, I'll ask my colleagues if they have a any question for you? I'll begin with Commissioner Ryan. Any question? Yes, I do. Look, um, you provided. First of all, I didn't quite get. You you told us that you had been looking after Caleb and Jonathan for twelve months. The provider you, service provider, what do we call them? Service provider one. Have they been looking after them for a longer period of that because they've yes. been. How long would that be? Yes, so I've just been in the role for just about a year, and so we have been supporting them for coming up to three years. Okay. Yeah. And I understand, I think, from your statement that the support you provide in NDIS terms is called support for independent living. Yes. And I noticed some of the other supports you provide are things like GP, an occupational therapist, a behavioural therapist, and a speech therapist. Yes. Do they have any other sort of social supports other than that? They sound like terribly medical things. Mm. Um, is there not something else that sort of extends outside of that? Not at the moment, no. Um, <coughs> again, I'm hoping to look for a day program or day service for mostly Caleb at the moment and hopefully if Jonathan might be a further down the track uh, thing for him, um, but mostly the social interactions again is from the staff, myself, and appointments at the moment. They do they meet anybody else their own age in any context at all? No, because this morning we had a witness describe to us that they were playing with a neighbour's child, mm. and even the neighbour's child was surprised that one of them was able to play ball. Yep, um, it sounds a long time in three years they haven't been able even able to go back to that. I mean, previously they went to school. One mm. imagines that they met other people. Um, it just seemed an awful long time. I mean, and from my experience in your field, many of the things you've told us about today are pretty typical of what we would find in a group home. It's almost ticking off that and almost repetitive. I mean, I, I can't help but notice that your description of the activities done by both of the young men are almost exactly the same. If I look at the statement with regard to Caleb, there's a list, point form list, and it's almost exactly the same list as prevented. I mean, does it not worry you that there's not something different in their life after three years? I accept that you had a long way to go and you've come a long way, but it does seem terribly medical, terribly typical, of the kind of support that's provided in... Because do they have any other providers outside of SIL? No, they don't, no. OK. Mm. Well, did you want to comment on my observations about...? Uh, yeah, um, I can't speak so much for me being in this role and what occurred there. I have been reaching out to the support coordinator to get help with finding a day program or other interactions for them. What about something completely unstructured, like just going somewhere where they would see other people? I mean, for example, the parks they go to, is that almost... The, do they have a routine of which park they go to? No, in? they don't have a routine. Um, I know some days they it can... They go together? Yes, they do go together. They are... Uh, I know when Caleb is seen by his behaviourist, they do go to 
a different location and leave the, leave the home and have that separate time there. All right, thank you. Commissioner Mason. Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm just uh, following on with Commissioner Ryan's comments about um, Ms Hare's evidence this morning. I think one of the uh, animated parts of her evidence was uh, the boys playing with her dogs. Mm. And I thought that that around um, an emotional encouragement and attachment, but also mm. around skills and leadership. I thought that that was a really interesting uh, part of her evidence because it was um, showing uh, the empathy that the boys were having with her dogs. Yes. Um, and also uh, concur with what Commissioner Ryan was saying around uh, Miss Hare's son playing with Caleb. Um, and that there was a there was a sense of wanting to be um, playful. Mm. So um, um, I'd I'd encourage the service provider to look at those activities yep. because um, the boys were very much enjoying those interactions. Um, even this hair's evidence around the chickens mm. and mm. finding that a playful playful thing. So. Um, but thank you very much for your evidence today, um, Alexis. Um, Alexis, uh, a few questions for me. Firstly, I note from the statement for both Caleb and Jonathan, they don't have access to independent advocacy services. Mm. Can you tell me why they don't have access to any services like that? No, I can't tell you why. I'm sorry. So you don't know if any efforts have been made to link them with independent... Not that services? I know of. No. The other question is, could you expand a bit more when you were talking about the communication strategies you're doing with them? What about um, iPads and software and, you know, just all the amazing technology that we have these mm. days? Are you looking closely at that? Not so much iPads um, and things like that. We uh, did up a communication booklet for them both to use, um, which had familiar places, familiar food items and uh, other items in their routines, such as toileting, uh, sharing, um, things like that. It was hard for them to show interest in that, um, but we are working toward it. So... Um, that's why we did get some of those pictures done up and put around the home um, just because I know they can recognise them. Um, so we did get them printed that way. So just to close this off, so you don't know if attempts have been made to be innovative and think outside the box in terms of different ways of communication. I'm not getting that sense from you. Perhaps expand a bit more. Um, I think we are now. Again, I can't so much talk about when we did first support um, Caleb and Jonathan, but with the new uh, OT and the new uh, items she's trying to access for them both, that will, I think, help more with their communication. Before we uh, excuse you, I'll check in with Eastman. Do the parties with leave to appear? I can see shaking heads, so I assume no question. Thank you. Alexis, thank you very much. We're very grateful for your contributions. It's been very uh, important to hear from you about the services that you're providing to Caleb and Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. You may be excused, and I will now ask Ms Eastman what next. Well, uh, the next witness is Ms Shana Smith. I know she's here, but we might just take five minutes, if that's convenient, to the Royal Commissioners to reconstitute the hearing room. Thank you. All right, so it's now almost 25 past. So would 2.30, half past 2? Yes. Two? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back at 2.30. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session.
Yes, Ms. Eastman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner McHugh. And our next witness is Shana Smith, the Public Guardian of Queensland. And I welcome Ms. Smith back. I think this is the third time Ms. Smith's given evidence in addition to public hearing six, public hearing 30, and I understand you'll take an affirmation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ms. Smith, for coming back again. We're very grateful for your ongoing uh, contribution to the, the work that we're, we're doing. Uh, I'll just quickly explain. I'm Commissioner McEwen. This is Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Ryan. I'll ask now the associate to administer the affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Miss Eastman will now ask some questions. Thank you. So I just confirm you are Shana Smith. I am. And you are the public guardian for Queensland. Yes. And you're appointed under the Public Guardian Act 2014. Correct. You have prepared a statement for this uh, public hearing dated the 28th of April 2023. Yes. Are there any corrections or amendments to the statement? No. And are the contents of the statement true and correct? Yes. Now, I think on two previous occasions, uh, I have asked you about your role as public guardian and the discharge of your functions. I'm going to take it that those who follow the work of the Royal Commission will be aware of your previous evidence, and if they're not, then it's available to them on the Royal Commission's website. I want to focus on two issues in your evidence this afternoon. The first is the circumstances in which the public guardian came to be appointed for both Caleb and Jonathan, respectively. And secondly, I want to turn to the way in which a human rights approach operates in Queensland. This afternoon, the commissioners will hear from you, but also from the Queensland Human Rights Commissioner. And as a public entity in Queensland, making decisions and acting consistently with human rights is now part of your functions. So I want to ask you some questions about how does that work in practice and perhaps we can see it operating in practice in the context of some of the decisions that you've had to make in the lives of Caleb and Jonathan. Sure. All right. So uh, I think I might have mucked up, if I can use that very legal expression, uh, the dates for the guardianship appointments uh, earlier today. So can I just start with how the public guardian came to be appointed in the circumstances for both Caleb and Jonathan? Uh, we'll start with Caleb, and you've set this out in your statement, and commissioners, if you have Ms Smith's statement, this is paragraph 14 and following on page two. We know from the chronology that Caleb and Jonathan were found in their home on the 27th of May 2020, and we know from the agreed facts that both of them were admitted to hospital and treated in relation to severe malnutrition. In relation to Caleb, on the 3rd of June 2020, QCAT made an interim order appointing the public guardian for decision making in relation to Caleb's accommodation, healthcare, and the provision of services, including in relation to the NDIS for a period of three months. Then on the 2nd of September 2020, QCAP made an order appointing the public guardian for a further five years for decision making for the provision of services, including in relation to the NDIS. And on the 31st of March 2021, QCAT appointed the public guardian for decision making in relation to restrictive practices generally for Caleb for a period of two years and that appointment has since lapsed. That is correct. Right. So does that cover the, the various orders made by QCAT in relation to Caleb? Yes. And at the time the order was made appointing a public guardian for Caleb, he was an adult? Yes. And your functions and powers, together with your responsibility in relation to Caleb, are centred on the matters described in paragraph 17 of the statement. And I want to ask you about some of those matters. 
So supported decision making wherever possible, otherwise substituted decision making and advocacy in relation to the guardianship order, and also independent monitoring through the community visitor program and the adequacy and appropriateness of the service provided at his accommodation. So in relation to the supported decision making wherever possible, and otherwise substitute decision making and advocacy. These are topics I know we've spoken about generally at public hearing 30. But um, in terms of KLAB, what have been the steps taken on supported decision making wherever possible for him? Well, in relation to um, the matters that we assist Caleb with making decisions at present, that's only service provision mm. decisions. So, I mean, there's inherently a tension in the Guardianship and Administration Act because um, the tribunal actually makes a declaration of incapacity for those decisions mm -hmm. and appoints the public guardian as a substitute decision maker. And the legislation states that where that is done, we're not required to assess capacity and, and incapacity can pr be presumed. But in pr practice, um, we follow the general principles of the legislation, which apply more widely than formal decision makers. They also apply to the community and informal decision makers. And within that, there's a structured decision making approach. And that starts with um, supporting decision making where possible. Um, elements of supported decision making mean that Ultimately, a person um, needs to understand their choices in relation to the decision and also be able to communicate their needs and wants. So when a decision needs to be made um, in relation to Caleb's service provision, then um, obviously we would look at that decision and um, see if that's a decision that Caleb can understand his choices in relation to and whether he can communicate effectively what he might want in relation to that decision. Okay. Um, so, so there's been approximately 27 service provision decisions for Caleb since our initial appointment. And as you've heard earlier today, that the majority relate to allied health um, support. There's also been a multitude of NDIS um, decision making and also um, service provision decisions in, in, in relation to the support coordinator under that NDIS plan. So when um, we were back at public hearing 30 and examining supported decision making, one aspect of the evidence arising in that public hearing was the importance of staff and particularly from a public guardian's perspective, getting to know the person and knowing the person is uh, material to the person's choice and control, being able to articulate their choice and control, and then to support a person in the way the decisions are made, even when you, ha you don't have to really do that, do you? In relation to Caleb, the interim order was made while he was in hospital, and less than a week after his father had passed away. The guard, public guardian had no involvement in the lives of Caleb or Jonathan before that time. When uh, the public guardian was appointed on an interim basis and then a few months later, a permanent basis, what information, if any, did you have about Caleb? Um, no information. And therefore, really, we were starting from square one. And the initial NDIS plan, the funding involved um, the obtaining of a range of assessments from the, from the range of medical and allied health professionals so we can begin to understand Caleb's, um, his needs, his function, his functional assessments, and also begin to um, provide that stability in his life through his service provision so we can understand what his uh, likes dislikes are and, and needs and wants. So it takes time to build up that, that raft of information. Um, the assessments are undertaken by the team that wrap around him, um, the professionals, and through those reports and assessments, we begin to understand what, um, for example, Caleb's communication functions were and what his... Um, 
I guess, his capacity to build those skills within a range of areas. So that included through dietitian assessments, occupational therapist assessments, um, through speech therapists, and also through a positive behaviour support specialist who is, who is a psychologist. So it's about that information gathering at that beginning stage mm -hmm. to, because we, we didn't have, we weren't um, privy to any of that. The public guardian uh, in Queensland doesn't have, for example, the powers to say to child safety, to Department of Health, to Department of Education, we would like the information about this young person so that we can have an understanding and build a picture of what his life was like before you assume that role of substitute decision making. You don't have We can power. ask for the information, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily forthcoming. And sometimes that information, for example, we have in the past asked for a child safety um, background, but it may not contain those types of assessments that I just discussed. It may give us a picture about um, you know, events that have happened prior to our um, engagement and prior to our appointment, but usually those health assessment reports are not part of that 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 same you know um, child protection file. And for Caleb, he's an adult at the time of the appointment being made, and it had been some time since he had been at school. Were you able to obtain any information about his life in the immediate? Uh, 18 months before his father's passing? No, my understanding was um, that we um, did seek information from the education, um, but due to privacy reasons, it, it was not provided. But other than that, no. All right. Now, you touched on privacy and one of the uh, more recent developments in Queensland has been the introduction of a Human Rights Act in Queensland. It commenced in January 2020. So it has been in operation over the period you've been Caleb's guardian. And one of the human rights recognised in the Human Rights Act is privacy. Sometimes the right to privacy uh, cannot operate as an absolute right. And there has to be some movement or perhaps limitation on privacy to achieve a greater purpose. When your office is met with privacy as a reason not to provide information, how do you navigate around those issues and uh, work to achieving respect for human rights, be it privacy or the other rights in that act? Well, we do, um, we do work with our government partners in relation to information sharing. Um, and I do have the ability under the legislation to request certain information, but obviously it's about whether they can release it under their own um, governing acts as well. Um, and there is a level of, um, I guess, high level information sharing, but in terms of being provided the detail, it really is dependent on those releasing agencies and whether they they will provide that. Right. I want to ask you about uh, the Guardian's role in relation to restrictive practices. And you've given an example in your statement at paragraph 41 on page six and following around a decision which you've described as restrictive practices decision in relation to Caleb. I think I mentioned a moment ago, QCAT uh, granted an order that the Guardian could make decisions with respect to restrictive practices. And I wanted to ask you about this because a restrictive practice itself may be a limitation on a person's human rights. And with the framework under the Human Rights Act operating in Queensland, how does the Guardian and your office work through meeting a human rights framework, but at the same time making decisions to restrict somebody's rights through a restrictive practice? And if you want to take us through the example that you've given for Caleb and, uh, and speak to those human rights issues, I'll leave that sure. open to you. I know there's a lot of material in your statement covering these two questions. I will begin by saying Queensland's the only jurisdiction where a guardian 
can make a restrictive practice decision. In other states and territories, um, that is generally made through a senior practitioner or clinical model. So I think from the outset, there's an inherent tension that a guardian who um, really is tasked with the promotion and protection of rights and interests is making a decision <laughs> that is restricting those rights and interests. Um, standing in the shoes of the person, it would be difficult to envisage that they would make that own decision about themselves. So there's already that inherent tension at the outset. So how we work with that is through the, um, the authorisation regime, which is set up in the Disability Services Act mm -hmm. and also the Guardianship and Administration Act. And um, the service provider that would like to um, utilise the restricted practices makes an application and that supporting that application, um, there is a positive behaviour support plan that needs to be um, submitted with that. And that outlines the behaviours, um, the incidents, because it has to actually relate to um, behaviours of harm. So there has to be evidence supporting that. It can't just be something that is anticipated or a concern. Um, and then um, also in conjunction with that, there needs to be uh, positive behaviour support strategies because ultimately the objective, if there is a restrictive practice in place, is the ultimate reduction and, and elimination mm -hmm. of that restrictive practice. So as you said, um, authorising that restrictive practice is a restriction on a person's human rights and um, it needs to be, if approved, for the shortest time possible. So the example I've given in my statement relates to Caleb and, um, as we heard service provider A previously talk about the locked pantry, and that the behaviours of harm that Caleb was um, displaying related to... Um, seeking out that food and if he was not supervised in doing that there was the um the the i guess the issue where he would also eat the un inedible items such as packaging and there's also the risk of choking because he would eat too quickly mm -hmm. and the big the bite-sized pieces would be too large so they were the incidents that were provided as the behaviours of harm and um, how we follow our supported decision-making framework and also the Human Rights Act and acknowledge that that is a limitation, that lock on the pantry. But we have to look at whether that is justified and proportionate in the circumstances. And the justification is, well, the harm and the level of risk that Caleb could experience could be actually very severe and significant. So how do you go about uh, taking those considerations into account and having enough evidence to support the decision making, particularly in circumstances where you may not have any information about what the uh, dietary arrangements were prior to their father's death? or Caleb's father's death, and the way in which food and access to food was managed in the family home prior to the father's death. How do you go about collecting the evidence so that you can work through that uh, framework of deciding what's the right, could the right or should the right be impaired, and how do you take as you describe, a proportionality analysis, so the least restrictive means directed to a particular purpose. How did you go about assessing the evidence in this example? Well, Caleb is obviously expressing or communicating his desire to seek out that food. Um, it is correct we didn't know the exact circumstances of his background, but we knew enough to know that he had likely had that restriction in place and therefore he could be, his communication of wanting that food could be resulting from those circumstances. In conjunction with um, looking at that limitation, we, we did end up providing approval for that restrictive practice, for, but for only for four months. And within that time, we conditioned that approval with um, needing further assessments for Caleb by dietitians to understand 
why he might be seeking that food. Is it sensory? Is it another form of communication? Also through occupational therapist reports and positive behaviour support specialists to determine um, the intentions of those behaviours and whether that limitation is something um, that in the future will be needed or can he learn other skills and be redirected through positive behaviour support. Does that answer your question? No. Dan, I'm going to get really practical. Yeah. The, the problem identified is access to a pantry mm. uh, and then Caleb enters the pantry and has unlimited access to the food and non-edible items. The solution seems to be restricting access to the pantry, a relatively simple thing, perhaps having a lock or some other restriction on it. That decision to have a lock is the restrictive practice, but what factors are taken into account in a very practical way to say this is the right form of practice, this is the least restrictive in the circumstances? Yeah, and that positive behaviour support plan does look at other strategies that can be but can be used and we rely on the advice from that specialist about whether locking the pantry at this point in time is the least restrictive mm. given the um, likely consequence of harm if that restriction isn't in place. So um, alongside that with the positive behaviour support strategies, I mean they are your other alternatives. Mm. So that could be through redirection or through constant supervision with, which is near impossible or um, through, um, I guess, strategies that allow access at certain times and, and build up for longer periods of time. But ultimately, that information from that specialist tells us whether it, with um, the skills development at the moment, is that, is that locking necessary to prevent the likely consequence of harm should it not be locked? And would a, a, a human rights approach say... If that restrictive practice and limitation of rights is in place for a short period of time, it must be accompanied by the other actions in supporting yes. the behaviours, yes. changing the patterns yes. and reappraising whether the restrictive practice should remain in place after a period of time. Absolutely. So at the end of that four-month period, if the service provider um, wanted a further approval, we um, condition that initial um, approval by saying you must provide a certain range of evidence um, in your next positive behaviour support plan. And that would also include articulating how the positive behaviour support strategies were used and whether they were effective and also what Caleb's um, views were about that. How did he react to those um, different strategies and were they effective? So does that, if we step back from that and say, what does this mean in terms of a human rights approach? The impact of the human rights approach is to not just see the problem as accessing the pantry, so automatically locking it, but it requires an understanding of what the impact of that decision or the restriction would mean for Caleb in terms of communication, uh, access to food sources, managing behaviour, and also assisting him to understand what is happening and why that practice is in place at the time. And yes, I agree. And it can't be looked at in isolation. Mm -hmm. So alongside that, um, in Caleb's everyday life, as we heard earlier, he is developing more daily living skills through choice and control around his um, home environment. He is actively participating with one-on-one um, -on -one sessions with a range of allied health professionals to build his communication skills and to um, understand what his um, sensory needs are. So all of that is happening in combination. And um, when that is successful and we understand more about what Caleb's needs and wants are, um, we're able to then tailor those strategies, those positive behaviour support strategies, so they're most effective for him with the view of reducing and eliminating that restrictive practice. So this is also an example where uh, working in the Human Rights Act framework as a public entity means 
you have to act consistently with the Human Rights Act. But there is another entity, the service provider A, that is critical to giving effect to that human rights framework. Yes. And I would imagine that in a lot of your work as a public entity applying human rights, you are engaging with a large number of entities that provide services and supports to people with disability who are not necessarily public entities. Yes. Unless they're performing a public function. Yes. They're functional entities. There is a provision in the Queensland Human Rights Act that describe NDIS providers as in some circumstances being public entities. Have you had to navigate around the different uh, obligations that might apply to the guardian, public guardian as a public entity, but engaging with other entities that are not public entities and not necessarily subject to the same human rights obligations? And how do you navigate or put the bridge up between the public functions and then into these more private functions or private entities. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm looking at the Human Rights Commissioner because I'm <laughs> going to ask him that question as well. And, and, and I, yeah. think, I think legally that's correct, um, that there is a difference between being a public entity and a non-public entity, but human rights are human rights. Mm. So we don't really draw that line. In our promotion of a person's human rights, we would expect everybody involved in their life to also be promoting their human rights. Um, and if it's not the technically the human rights under the Queensland Human Rights Act, there are a range of rights through the UN, you know, um, CRPD, or also through the general principles in the Guardianship and Administration Act, which apply to everybody in relation to supporting people um, in their decision making and mm -hmm. so on. So it's not just limited, uh, in my view, to public entities. All right, I want to turn to Jonathan. So, in terms of Jonathan, uh, on the 24th of March 2021, QCAT made an interim order appointing the public guardian to support Jonathan to make decisions in relation to his services, including the NDIS, for three months. Then on the 23rd of June 2021, QCAP made an order appointing a public guardian for two years to support Jonathan to make decisions with respect to his health care, provision of services, NDIS and restrictive practices. And uh, those that arrangement is coming up for renewal, mm. is that right? Yes, Fairly soon that's in correct. June. And in terms of the Guardian's powers, functions and responsibility with respect to Jonathan, it's the same as KLAB. It's the supported decision-making wherever possible but otherwise substitute decision-making. And it's also the independent monitoring through community visitors. In your statement, you've set out the decisions that you have supported Jonathan to make or in uh, some cases the substitute decision making in relation to his accommodation and also restrictive practices with him and the pantry. And here's a slightly different and I want to come to that in a moment. But I wanted to ask about this independent monitoring and the community visitor arrangement. Mm. Has that been a feature of supporting Caleb and Jonathan, and in particular Jonathan, who was a child at the time that uh, his father passed away, and then a few months or a month or so later then became an adult. So his circumstances are a little bit different to his brother's circumstances at the, at the beginning. Yes. Um, my agency also administers the Community Visitor Program and you're correct that um, as he was a child in care, he would have been visitable by the community visitors at a visitable site. Um, and he was with together with his brother at that time. So they did have that continuity in being able to visit them both um, when Jonathan was under 18 but also as an adult because they continue to live at a site which is deemed to be visitable. And you've set out the approach to the restrictive practices decision and, the, and if I just say the pantry, 
in paragraph 73 and following in your statement. And uh, there's been a different level of communication and engagement with service provider A in relation to Jonathan's access to the pantry that uh, as at January this year, the regional manager who's a, de a delegate of your decision making authorised the restriction of Jonathan's access to food in the pantry except during mealtimes and it's a conditional approval for a period of 12 months. And the factors that have been taken into account there are 12 months to see if the behaviours can be reduced and at the same time protecting Jonathan's rights and interests. So again, that balancing act has come into operation. What was the different evidence or circumstances to be taking into account in relation to the arrangements for Jonathan and the pantry, which are different to his brother? Well, Jonathan does have different communication um, to Caleb and also he um, wasn't responding as well to the positive behaviour support strategies which were trying to redirect his behaviour, his food seeking behaviour when the pantry was unlocked. So in considering that limitation, we needed to um, have a look at the evidence of the incidence of that food seeking behaviour, which was um, more often than Caleb, and also his ability to um, be re redirected from, from that behaviour. Uh, we saw that he really needed a longer period of time to be able to have a chance to develop the skills to be able to, um, to respond to that positive behaviour support. Therefore, um, again, given the harm that could be um, could happen to Jonathan or he could be experienced by Jonathan as a result of the pantry being unlocked and having unlimited access to the food. Uh, the harm was considered to be significant and therefore the limitation placed on his human rights was considered to be justified in the circumstances. And the consideration around the timing of that was the 12 months to, to be able to obtain that additional um, specialised positive behaviour support therapy and also training of service provider A in those strategies to hopefully reduce and eliminate that restrictive practice. So how does it work in practice where one of the brothers no longer has a restrictive practice to the pantry but the other brother does? That is a very good question. Uh, there was, therefore, when it is locked, there, we did identify that exact issue, that that was also going to be an indirect restriction on Caleb. Um, and we did, um, we have asked the service provider in those circumstances for information how they would um, reduce that limitation. And they've also worked with the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission around that. And the advice is that um, there can be um, a protocol developed to reduce that limitation on cut. And for example, things that could be done is um, that Caleb can have his own mini pantry, for example, in, in an area that he can access mm. at all times, or um, whenever Caleb requests to access the pantry, obviously he, he is able to do that. Mm. So there are, but I acknowledge that there is that indirect restriction when that happens with a co-tenant and that would be in any co-tenant situation. All right, I have two more questions that I want to ask you about and that is uh, in relation to the guardian's role. We have explored in earlier hearings, particularly public hearing 30 concerning guardianship and supported decision making, but also more recently in public hearing 32 where we had the opportunity to speak to service providers about the role of independent advocates. I think in public hearing 30 you might recall that there was some evidence that the guardian is not the support coordinator. It is not the guardian is not there to necessarily advocate on behalf of the person for whom they are authorised to make substitute decision making. And for clients who 
are non-verbal, if I can use that shorthand description, as inadequate as it is, uh, who may not be able to communicate their needs, their interests and their wishes in a way to, to their own service providers, that there is a vital role for independent advocates to make these systems work. That system between guardian and service provider, guardian and client and service provider and client. There's nothing we've seen in the material available to the Royal Commission that either Caleb or Jonathan have had access to independent advocates consistently throughout the course of their life. I think there's some occasions where it's been suggested and maybe one or two occasions where someone's offered or been around, but not on a, a consistent level. To what extent, reflecting on the situation of Caleb and Jonathan at the present time, is there a place for independent advocacy in their current arrangements? That's the first question. And then secondly, what role, if any, do you have in the scope of your decision making to require those arrangements to be put in place? Uh, we do make referrals to independent advocates on behalf of clients and then the independent advocate would work with the client to seek their direct consent to be their advocate. Um, we don't make a mm. service provision decision for, in, for an independent advocate to provide those mm. services. Um, you're correct that Caleb and Jonathan do not have an independent advocate at the moment, but um, we would have no issue with, with an independent advocate uh, working with them. And when I'm saying independent advocate, that's not criticising or at all suggesting that there's any deficiencies in their relationship with their current service provider. I think we've heard that their current service provider has uh, enhanced the quality of their life in many respects, but their own voices mm. to support their choice and control and to help them develop the skills of decision making is an area which I think on the material we have asked how would this happen and uh, who would it take to put those arrangements in place. So that's something yeah. you can suggest but not require, is that right? That's correct. Right. Ms Smith, you'll be pleased to know this will be the last time in this Royal Commission <laughs> that you will be required to give evidence. And for my part, um, I thank you for uh, being so cooperative with us each time we've asked you, often with very short notice, to prepare statements and to participate in our hearings. So my thanks to you on behalf of the council assisting team and OSA. But the commissioners may still have some questions for you. Thank you, Commissioner McEwen. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I will ask my colleagues if they have any questions. Commissioner Mason. Um, yes, th thank you for your evidence this afternoon. I just have a general question. Um, listening to the service provider one's evidence and also listening to Ms. Hare's evidence this morning, um, these two young men are effectively now living in their own home. Who's, who's, who, whose responsibility is it? in terms of keeping their eye on the detail that these young men are living in a home and not a house, given the experience that they've, they've had in their early life. Whose responsibility is it to make a home and not just live in a house? And, and what does it mean to live in a, in a home? I think it's all of our responsibility. I think it's important that, and, and, and this has been one of the you know, the benefits of the NDIS is that um, having lots of more people involved in their lives, I think that responsibility is shared. I think that um, primarily the service provider that has that daily and ongoing uh, relationship has a large responsibility. But I would say that also a guardian has uh, a, a responsibility in relation to their area of appointment to make sure that they're, um, for example, service provision, they're um, receiving the services that they need. So it, it's also, a, I guess, a, 
a slower process than some we would we might like for it to take. So, for example, we're at a point now, three years um, up after our initial appointment, that we have a lot of rich information uh, about Caleb and Jonathan through knowing what their um, likes and dislikes are and their needs are in terms of sensory needs and their functional assessments and so on. And I think with that, it's really about building that pathway for them and that capacity development to make sure that um, it's not just more of the same and that it is uh, a journey for them that really makes their house a home, but also their, their life um, full. An inclusive experience um, is what I think you're saying. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, do you have any yeah, questions? Sure. Can I, I think there'd be something in regard to the restrictive practice. I thought there was a very interesting thing that you said at part 48 of your um, statement, where you describe what happened where you determined not to give um, permission for a, a uh, restrictive practice that someone had applied for. And I thought it would be useful to actually have that in the public evidence of the transcript. Would you like to describe what happened in regard to the application with regard to uh, restricting, I think it was Caleb's Caleb, access yes. to sharp knives and objects, a very common um, application, as I understand it, made in group homes. Yes, so the original application was not only for a restrictive practice to lock <coughs> the pantry, but also restricted access to um, sharp objects being knives. And um, that, that restriction was not authorised, and that is because um, the supporting positive behaviour support plan couldn't outline, um, I guess, enough evidence to support the need for the use of that restriction. Uh, there was there was some evidence that was provided that Caleb liked to flick clean his knife, but in relation to there being a um, behaviour of harm, where the the result might be significant harm in terms of risk, the evidence just did not um, support the restrictive practice being applied. If I might just for a second, and I'm not saying I agree with this position, but I think there might be people interested in hearing this question asked, that's a pretty significant decision to make if that went terribly wrong. How would you be sure that you had made the right decision um, if that went pear-shaped at a later time? And you're right, there is a risk assessment that must be made. Um, and we do have, as part of our supported decision-making framework, we do have a risk matrix. And um, it's really about what um, Caleb has done in the past. Has he har ever harmed himself as a result of that? Is it, um, you know, a butter knife that may be at the dinner table? And, and so it's looking at the evidence provided and making a determination, well, no, he has never harmed himself in the past from, from that behaviour. Um, therefore, is that restriction to employ a restrictive practice to lock access to all of, you know, those utensils? Is that appropriate and proportionate in this instance? And it was decided that it was not. Ben, um, the last witness explained to us that the service provider witness explained to us that um, Caleb and Jonathan don't have a lot of contact with anyone else in their lives. And there was some interesting testimony given to us very early this morning about from a neighbour who uh, was asked a question, as you know, Caleb and Jonathan then moved from where they were living. And Miss Hare said yes, and you haven't been able to have an ongoing contact with them or a relationship with them. And she said no, and then she went on to say, um, Miss Eastman then said, um, and that's really a really distressing thing for you as well. And Miss Hare said yes, it's kind of like the end of the story that hasn't happened. I am aware through various means that there are quite often people who seem to have be important in people's lives and the public guardian seems to continue to play a role in separating those people and usually they, meet, they can't find them, they can't get their address. It's usually said that you know, there has to be protected for privacy. Now, I can't obviously make a decision in this case, of course, but is there not a way and, we, you know, is there more work we need to do in terms of this could be, this could be someone who could interact with them 
um, in a way which it would extend this appears to be someone who had a positive relationship with them, and yet they are now denied all access, and there doesn't seem to be a route by which they can go through to restore that. Do you think we need to have some mechanism whereby people can at least make a reasonable assessment as to whether a former relationship should continue? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we were not privy to that information, um, and we would absolutely want to support those uh, social networks. Um, I agree, and, and I think that if that information can be shared, it would be very valuable. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's about um, denying those relationships because we don't even, we don't, we didn't even know that existed. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Smith, in response to Ms. Eastman's questions about um, independent advocacy and access, you responded to say you make a referral of a, an organisation to the service provider. And we've heard that Caleb and Jonathan don't have access. What role do you take? Do you investigate to find out why that referral hasn't happened or why a relationship hasn't formed between an in independent advocacy and the clients? Uh, did that not raise question in your mind? So in referring to an independent advocacy agency, we, we would directly make that referral um, and then if they, um, if they contacted the client separately, I mean, we, we may follow up about that, but um, really that becomes a direct relationship that we don't try and influence um, or control through our decision-making. Why not? Wouldn't it raise questions, though, if you are trying to do everything you can in your power and your responsibility to give say, Caleb and Jonathan, the best access possible to their lives, wouldn't that raise questions if, that, if the referral went nowhere? Well, I think some would see, see that as a conflict of interest if we had... So we would really leave that relationship between the independent advocate and between Caleb and Jonathan. Um, so we wouldn't be able to force, I guess, that um, independent advocacy service... Does that oh, answer your question? Uh, almost. I'm, and then I'm coming <laughs> to the end. Uh, so we've heard that some service providers prevent independent advocacy and advocates from having access, you know, coming onto the premises and having access to people living, for example, in group homes. Right. Would that raise the question yes, in your yes. mind? Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. But I'll, I'll, I'm putting that to you. And do you agree with that? Yes. If, if it was a service provider... Like, actively preventing access, then yes, because we do have a role in um, a service provision decision around the suitability of that service provider in providing services to Caleb and Jonathan. So that would be a absolutely a consideration. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you again, Ms Smith. Uh, as I, as both Ms Eastman and myself have said, you've contributed substantially to the work of our commission. So thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh, Again, I know the Commission is grateful for your contribution. Thank you. So you may be excused. And now, uh, uh, Ms Eastman, next step, shall we take a break? I, if we can take a very short break uh, and resume at 3.25, and that's a very short break, just to reconstitute the hearing room and Mr McDougall will be the final witness for today. Sorry, I just missed what you were saying. So it's nearly 3.25. So are you suggesting come back at 3.30? Uh, I think I can agree no. to 3.30. Uh, yes, uh, I'm looking at it. My clock is 3.22. Right. So if you don't mind, at 3, oh, uh, 3.30. Okay. All right, thank you. We'll thank come back at 3.30. Mr. Eastman. Uh, thank you. Our is Commissioner Scott McDougall, and he is the Human Rights Commissioner here in Queensland. 
And I think the Commissioner will take an affirmation. Commissioner McDougall, thank you very much uh, for coming. We're very grateful for uh, your forthcoming contribution to our, our work and also for the material that you've uh, provided. I was just quickly explain, I'm Commissioner McEwen, this is Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Ryan. I'll now uh, yes, I'll ask uh, the associate to do the um, affirmation. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, there's no written statement. Uh, we ask the Commissioner to come and give his evidence orally today. But in the hearing bundles, you have a copy of the Human Rights Commission's submission to the Royal Commission and a number of extracts and documents from the Commission's reports and also guiding principles for public entities. I think you have an outline of the topics that I'd like to explore with the Commissioner this afternoon, but I want to start by introducing you to Commissioner McDougall. So, Commissioner, you commenced as Commissioner on the 8th of October 2018. Yes. And at that time, the Commission was still or by the name of the Anti-Discrimination Commission of Queensland. Yes. And prior to your appointment as the Commissioner, you were the Director and Principal Solicitor at Caxton Legal Centre in Brisbane. Yes. And you held that position for some time, is that right? Yes, much longer than I thought I would originally, yes. Well, I'm going to give it away by saying that you're admitted to legal practice in 1993. Yes. And much of your professional life has involved advocating on behalf of communities and conducting litigation, particularly in the areas of discrimination, native title, mm -hmm. criminal law, guardianship and coronial inquiries. Yes. And you hold a Bachelor of Laws from the Queensland University of Technology. Yes. Now, you know that I want to ask you about the Human Rights Act. Yes. The Commissioners held a public hearing, uh, public hearing 18 some time ago, in looking at the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities into Australian law. And the Commissioners had the opportunity to look at some Australian models that existed at that time, in particular the ACT Human Rights Act, and to a lesser extent, the Victorian Charter. Since uh, that hearing, the Human Rights Act in Queensland has now come into operation and I wanted to ask you some questions about how the Act operates and specifically around public entities. So the Act uh, commenced on the 1st of January 2020, is that right? Uh, the obligations commenced on the 1st of January 2020, they actually commenced on the 1st of July 2019. And all individuals in Queensland are said to have human rights as described in the Act. That's right. And the objects of the Act are set out in Section 3. And the principal objects of the Act are to promote, protect and promote human rights and to build a culture in Queens, the Queensland public sector that respects and promotes human rights and to help promote a dialogue about the nature meaning and scope of human rights. Is that right? Yes. So the uh, Queensland Act is based on what's commonly called a dialogue model, mm -hmm. and that's similar to the model in the ACT and Victoria. Yes, and the United Kingdom as well. And the dialogue model, in a sense, is a model that looks to the protection of human rights by ensuring that the three principal arms of government are talking to each other. Correct. So the Parliament, in its role in considering, developing and passing legislation, has human rights responsibilities to ensure that legislation passed by the Parliament considers and reflects and, as far as possible, is consistent with relevant human rights. Correct. Then in that dialogue model, there is the role for the public service or the executive the executive are that arm of government that often engage with the members of the public in the delivery of services, yes. be it in transport, education, health, community activities, child protection and the like. 
And a dialogue model says that when the executive or the public sector are making decisions about us in the community or uh, deciding policies that might impact on our lives, that as far as possible, they should act consistently in the decision making and policy making that is uh, a way that gives effect to human rights. I'm putting paraphrasing it that generally. Yes, that's right. Uh, but who actually is uh, covered as part of the executive drills down to something called public entities. Yes, and they're defined in Section 9. And, and I want 10. to come back and talk about public entities in a bit more detail. But just keeping going on the dialogue model, there's also the role of the courts, and if I put tribunals in for present purposes, and that is that the courts have a responsibility of giving effect to laws, in determining the meaning of legislation, resolving disputes, and particularly where courts have to make decisions about the way in which the executive have made their decisions, the dialogue model says that the courts need to be part of that conversation as well, and as far as possible, interpreting legislation consistently with human rights. Yes, and the courts are also bound as public entities when they're acting administratively as well. So the idea is that if the arms of government are working together and that they are all having the human rights conversation, the hope is that that builds a human rights culture and that culture threads through the way in which government engages with the public, in this case, the public in Queensland. Yes. But it's all about human rights. So where do the human rights come from for the Queensland Act? Are these, and I can say this as a person from New South Wales, are these peculiarly and uniquely human rights for Queensland or do they come from a range of sources? Well, they're drawn from the two conventions, the ICCPR and the ICESR. So the economic, social, cultural rights that are um, in Queensland, uh, the right to health and the right to education. Queensland also does have a right to property, which is a little bit unusual, which is drawn from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well. But in totality, there are 23 rights and most of them are from the ICCPR. So when you're talking about the ICCPR commissions, we're talking about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And that's an international law that Australia ratified in August 1980. And Australia's got international obligations under the shorthand ICCPR to ensure that the rights in that covenant apply in Australia. It's a case, isn't it, that the ICCPR mostly focuses on a style of rights commonly referred to as civil and political rights. So there's sorts of rights that might be couched in the freedom to do things, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of association. And it's also the types of rights that we might look at as procedural rights. So the right not to be arbitrarily detained, the right to not be arbitrarily arrested, a right to a fair trial, a right to fair conditions in detention. There's a real mixture of rights in the ICCPR, is that right? Yes, and generally it's about telling um, authorities what they can't do without necessarily telling them what they ought to do, but there are some rights where there are positive obligations in, imposed. I think the old theory about the ICCPR was that people's human rights would be protected and respected if we just left people alone. Mm. So if government in a sense, stepped back from interfering in people's lives, then those freedoms to go about their business or say what they wish to say would be protected. But that theory, I think, has come under challenge in more recent times that um, if, for example, the right to a fair trial is a right that's effectively enforced, you can't just step back and do nothing. It requires some significant investment by the state to make a functioning justice system work. So, so has Queensland taken the approach that civil and political rights are not the class of rights? You step back, do nothing, and everything will be okay? Yes, and the Queensland Human Rights Act is due for a review after the 1st of July this year. And I, I think it's fair to say that one of the issues that will be looked at closely is the enforcement um, of the Act and the impact that 
the existing enforcement mechanisms have or don't have. Okay. The other covenant that you referred to is the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and that's often seen as the twin to the ICCPR. Australia ratified ICESCO, if I can use that expression, before the ICCPR. But ICESCO is really around economic, social and cultural rights. And are these the types of rights that require government to be active in ensuring through its policies, practices and laws that the right to work, the right to education, the right to an adequate standard of living, the rights to participate in the cultural life of the nation require proactive action by government and doesn't the convention talk about progressively realising these rights? Yes, because they are tied to resources, then the principle of progressive realisation is an important part of the implementation of them. And so these international rights essentially apply to the Commonwealth Government in terms of the obligations, but they've been drawn on to bring them into a particular Queensland focus. Is that right? Yes. So the 23 rights that are protected are... Yes, they're drawn and to reflect Queensland's domestic implementation of those international instruments. And Queensland has some of the ICESCA rights in, for example, the right to education, that every child has the right to access to primary and secondary education appropriate to the child's needs. Yes. And also the right to health services. So Section 37 provides the right that every person has a right to access health services without discrimination. Yes. The, uh, there's also rights in relation to the protection of family and children, and that's drawn on a right in the ICCPR, but it identifies the importance of families as a fundamental group. And the positive obligation attached to that right is the state to support functioning families. Is that right? Yes, in 26.1. And, and, you know, in the child protection context, you've got 26.1 about, you know, recognising and protecting the family unit. Um, and then 26.2 about acting in the best interests of, of children. So they often have to be balanced against each other. So we know from the international law that particularly civil and political rights, with some very minor exceptions, are not considered to be absolute rights, and those rights can be limited in a range of different ways. Does the Queensland Human Rights Act have a provision setting out when and how any of the human rights that operate in Queensland can be limited? Yes, Section 13 is the General Limitations Clause, which sets out the circumstances that, that can be considered in limiting a, a justifying a limitation on a human right. And that the way the limitation clause would operate is a little bit like the questions you heard me ask Ms Smith at a very localised level, and that is to be clear about the nature of the right and if there's a limitation to really step through by having the relevant evidence about why the right should be limited, the purpose for the limitation, the nature of the limitation, whether the limitation is necessary, and if so, in the least restrictive way. That's sometimes called a proportionality analysis, is that right? Yes, and I think it's the real value of the Human Rights Act is introducing a requirement on decision makers to explore those reasonably available alternatives. And I think that that is the, the, the greatest value of the Act um, because it, would, it forces um, an exploration of other ways of achieving the same result that will have less impact on the dignity of the person. So I want to then move to public entities. So we just leave the judiciary and courts tribunals to one side and parliament to the other side, focus on public entities that uh, this case study, as you know, is examining the experience of violence, abuse, neglect, and we submit the deprivation of rights of two young Queenslanders. And we've said to the commissioners this morning that we think that the violence, abuse, neglect and deprivation of their rights could have been prevented. And there are responsibilities now on public entities under the Human Rights Act that didn't exist for the whole of the period of time that we're looking at Jonathan and Caleb's rights, 
but we wanted to understand what's changed for public entities in Queensland since the Human Rights Act has come into operation and to uh, really have a sense for the commissioners to see, does a Human Rights Act make a difference? Now, I've asked you not to comment on the particulars of the, the case study and you're not privy to all of the detail, but I want to ask you about the nature of public entities in Queensland and what makes something a public entity by reference to performing functions of a public nature. I think that's section 10 of the Act. But how do we work out whether somebody is or isn't a public entity? Well, government agencies are quite clearly a um, public entity um, and the section 9 sets out, you know, who is a public entity. Um, I think where there is potentially doubt as to who's covered is the, what are described as functional public entities who are entities that are performing services of a public nature on behalf of the state. Um, registered uh, NDIS providers are specifically included as public entities, mm. but as I understand it in practice, there are a fair few disability service providers who um, are providing services that be that could potentially be a question mark whether the services they're providing are of a public nature or not. So they may or may not be caught by the Act. There's so, also provision in the Act um, for those um, organisations that are perhaps in doubt as to whether they're caught by the Act to actually opt in and have a gazette all made um, by the Attorney General. So working out who's a public entity might be easy, for example, if it's the department of something or uh, a particular statutory agency like the public guardian. The fuzzy area is where private bodies may be performing public functions. They may be subject to funding, wholly funded by public uh, funds, or they may be working in partnership with a public entity, and so that division of what is the public entity's responsibility and the impact on the private entity delivering those services, for example, might carry through that function. So the question of who is a public entity is a very fact-specific question, is that right? You have to look at all the facts and the sources of power. Yes, and you know, ultimately, hopefully it wouldn't come to a better um, a court may be called upon to determine whether it is a public entity. And as you've said, the registered NDIS providers and the Royal Commission's had a recent hearing about the distinction between registered and unregistered providers, they are identified as public entities in the Act if the NDIS provider is performing functions of a public nature in Queensland. Now, in the scenario that I've given to Ms Smith today is she is exercising functions as a public oh sorry, a public entity in performing her role and duties as the guardian. Her decisions have to be implemented by a registered NDIS provider. Arguably, service provider A would be a public entity when doing the restrictive practices activities, but may not be a public entity when doing other things. Is that the conundrum that might arise in working out who a public entity is? Yeah, that's a good example. Do you think that there is a scope, and again, if I'm trespassing into areas that you are not comfortable to speak about, please tell me, but is there scope for uh, human rights acts to be much clearer in the way in which particular services that have a public and private element could be described as the types of entities with human rights functions in a clearer and easier way? Yes, I think so. And I think that will be an issue that will be picked up in the review of the Act as well. And in the work that you've done so far and we've given to the commissioners a guide to public entities in terms of two toolkits, some of the fact sheets and the flow charts in looking at making decisions informed by proper considerations of human rights, 
Have you had to develop anything for NDIS providers and how they may be drawn into the Queensland Act? Hmm. I don't believe we've developed any particular material specifically for NDIS providers. Um, we haven't received, as far as I'm aware, a complaint about a NDIS provider, which mm. we haven't got to our complaint mechanism yet, but that is mm. a possibility. But um, And I suspect that's because they're going to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. Um, so we, there hasn't presented a burning need for us to specifically target those providers. Obviously, there's good, you know, cause to, but in terms of the complaints that we receive. And, and an NDIS provider, regardless of in, in that perhaps conundrum of are they or are they not, depending on what they're doing, uh, that the provider itself could opt in to be treated as a public entity. So there's an opt-in provision that any private organisation can say, we want to join this human rights framework and this is our commitment to make our decisions to act compatibly with human rights. Yes, and there's two organisations that have done that so far. Only two? Yes. I'm hoping to need a, a large one soon. Right, <laughs> OK. Um, so that, I hope, Commissioners, gives you a broad outline of... Uh, the Act and the public entities operating, and we can look at that in a bit more detail in the documents. I want to then turn to two things. One is, what do you do if you think your human rights have been breached in Queensland? And we have looked at the redress and remedies and complaints pathways in the Victorian and ACT settings. But there's some unique features, isn't there, in Queensland about what people can do if they think a public authority, sorry, a public entity has not acted consistently with their rights. How do people go about making complaints or raising concerns about their human rights and their relationship with public entities? Well, essentially, there are two legal enforcement, uh, well, sorry, two enforcement mechanisms. Um, one is what they call a piggyback um, action. So in Section 59 of the Act, uh, Queensland's followed the uh, similar provision in, in Victoria, uh, which provides for someone attaching a human rights argument to a pre-existing independent cause of action. So it could be most likely judicial review or a discrimination complaint. So they can raise a human rights argument if they have a, a, another cause of action. So there's no direct cause of action um, in Queensland's Human Rights Act. Um, so can I just pause you there? So does that mean, for example, somebody with disability might feel that they've experienced disability discrimination and so they've got an action in relation to their rights under the Anti-Discrimination Act? And so in the process of seeking to enforce those rights, can they attach a human rights claim to the Anti-Discrimination Act claim? Yes, they could. So, for example, the right to humane treatment, um, which obviously isn't protected by the Anti-Discrimination Act, they could raise that issue um, in proceedings before QCAT um, by piggybacking it on to the discrimination complaint. Okay, I'm sorry for interrupting that's, you at that that's point. Fine. I just wanted to so the, clarify. The second mechanism is the mechanism that's uh, unique to Queensland, although I understand the ACT are bringing it in as well, and that gives um, a person who's aggrieved to the ability to make a complaint to the Commission alleging that a human right has been unjustifiably limited by a public entity, and that will result in the Commission bringing the parties together and trying to resolve the complaint. There's no right of referral to a tribunal. And I know many people think, well, that um, really limits the um, enforcement options and the, and the bargaining power of the complainant in that conciliation process. But the Commission does have the ability to publish a report under Section 88.4 of the Act 
uh, with recommendations about the steps that the public entity should take in order to act compatibly with human rights in the future. So, so far we've published a number of those reports. Um, the first one was about hotel quarantine arrangements during COVID. Um, and I, I think it's very early days of the Act. Uh, I think that mechanism has shown some promise, but it really hasn't been taken up in the way that I think um, it was anticipated to be to to be taken up as in terms of operating as a, a genuine enforcement mechanism for the Act. So uh, the right arises if I'm a person with disability, and I think a public authority has made a decision that. Uh, restricts my rights and I can challenge that restriction by making a complaint to your commission. As a person with disability, do I have to prove that the restriction's unreasonable or disproportionate? Do I have to prove anything if I'm going to make a complaint to you? No, the commission's not going to make any findings of fact. Our role really is to bring the, the parties together and I, I guess I give you one example during COVID, um, this mechanism actually did prove really valuable because we were able to um, take complaints. Uh, our complaint handling mechanism is a bit more flexible under the Human Rights Act than under the Anti-Discrimination Act, so we could respond to the complaints more fle flexibly. And we did have cases where families with children with with living with disability, with high needs, were able to be moved out of inappropriate quarantine arrangements, mm -hmm. put in more suitable arrangements uh, within hours, um, which really did underline the effectiveness of, of the Act. So if the, if the conciliation works well, then the person making the complaint can reach an agreement of the right outcome for them without having to wait for somebody to make a decision about it, but they negotiate what the outcome should be. Is that right? Yeah, look, I wouldn't want to set an expectation that we're going to resolve complaints within hours, but in that mm. particular situation, because of the processes we'd set up with Queensland Health who were and the relationships we we mm. built, we're able to pick up the phone and say, look, this family's in this situation, can you fix this? Mm. Um, but there's no reason why we couldn't um, operate similarly in other circumstances? Well, in circumstances where the subject matter of your complaint is an unfair, unreasonable or disproportionate impact or restriction of rights, having a mechanism that you can get a relatively quick remedy would be important, would it not? Uh, absolutely. And uh, is the process of conciliation generally something that yields quick and effective remedies for people? Uh, look, uh, you know, if you spoke to um, people who had lodged complaints with the Commission in recent times because of the backlog we've experienced, I'm sure they'd be saying it's not it's not fast, but sometimes it, it can be if it's urgent. We will certainly prioritise urgent um, complaints. Um, yeah. What if you can't, what if I come along and I'm hopeful of a conciliated outcome, but I there's a whole lot of information I don't know about as the complainant that the government's aware of, and the government just says, no, nope, this is the decision it is, and there's no hope of conciliating or reaching an outcome. What happens in those circumstances? Can I get more information from the government to understand the government's position, or can I say, I think I want to take this to a court or tribunal to really test what the government has said. So for a human rights complaint, um, the Commission does have the capacity to make requests for information. So if it thought that it was going to assist the conciliation to access that information, it could make the request to the public entity. Um, but there's no right of referral to a court. So, um, and we... I have to say, in recent times, we're experiencing sort of greater pushback from public entities and um, more reliance on Crown law lawyers to to um, engage in a legalistic way rather than a problem-solving way. I won't ask you to go into any details of any matters of that kind, but do you think that uh, from a broader 
stepping back on a human rights framework, that there needs to be another step beyond conciliation to achieve the types of rights in Article 2 of the ICCPR, which is a substantive right to an effective remedy. Is stopping at conciliation an effective remedy? And if not, what do you think, if you can comment on this, what do you think needs to be in place in the Human Rights Act to bed in that effective remedy? Uh, look, in my view, there needs to be a direct cause of action. Exactly where to, I think, would need to be worked out. At the time that the Parliament was considering introducing a Human Rights Act in Queensland, there was a former Supreme Court judge, uh, Chesterman, who made um, an observation, and he was actually not in favour of introducing a Human Rights Act, but he did make the point, and it really resonated with me, that a right that's not enforceable is not much of a right. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that, and it, it does go to how much we value human rights as to whether we're actually prepared to allow citizens to access the courts to enforce them. So uh, is that something that might be considered when Queensland does a review of the Human Rights Act, the effectiveness of remedies? It will certainly be part of our submission. I'm just conscious of the time, and the last topic I wanted to talk to you about is based on the Commission's experience now over a number of years of building what might what might be described as a rights-based culture and embedding that into decision-making, organisational culture, even attitudes around rights and what they mean, transparency and accountability, continuous improvement, and no doubt some ongoing barriers in achieving that. Um, I'll just pass over to you to tell the commissioners about what you've learnt over the last few years about a Human Rights Act supporting this embedding of the culture and changes in Queensland. So mm. what difference has it made? What can these commissioners uh, take into account when they're thinking about uh, improving the rights of people with disability? So I should say that before, and I should have mentioned this earlier, before we can entertain a complaint, a person does have to first complain to the agency and a unless it's exceptional circumstances. Um, so that in itself has led to public entities looking at their complaint mechanisms, and I, I think that there has been some improvement in the way that public entities are handling their internal complaints so that they um, don't find themselves in a situation where a complaint progresses to a human rights complaint. Um, I think that there, I think there were 220,000-plus public servants in Queensland, and then you've got all the other public entities as well. So educating all those public entities about their obligations under the, the Human Rights Act is a huge task. And the, the Act itself and human rights can easily overwhelm people. So in the first year of the Act, I think I did something like 50 different talks, I was doing one every second day and having to learn about the rights that were engaged by particular agencies and that, that's a task that agencies have had to come to grips with. What are the rights that are going to be engaged in the work that we do and the decisions that we make and how do we you know, ensure that we're acting compatibly when we're, we're doing that work? And Obviously, the higher the level of decision making and the greater the impact on, on people's rights, the greater the expectation and the quality of the decision making needs to be. And I think that's been reflected in decisions, including the Owen Darcy decision. So when you've got people on the front line and trying to educate police officers, for example, about you know, their obligations under the Human Rights Act, um, it, it's a big challenge, I think, to, to get them to understand the subtleties of Section 13, proportionality mm -hmm. analysis. And what I've tried to, to say to people is, you know, at that level, um, if you're getting overwhelmed, just think dignity because proper consideration is think, 
And when you boil down human rights at the heart of all of them is the dignity of the individuals who hold those rights. So that's about as simple as I can reduce it to think dignity. But just getting that message out I think is really important. And over time I think the role of the courts in developing a strong human rights jurisprudence. So I'm about to deliver a paper to the North Queensland Mm -hmm. Law Association where I'm going to be telling them we need to dial up the dialogue Mm -hmm. in the the model and to do that we really do need a strong jurisprudence that sits behind the rights. Mm -hmm. And it's only when that happens, I think, when, when those involved in making the decisions and acting on the ground know that there is a level of accountability that will flow from their their choices and the actions that they make when they're they're considering the dignity of the person on the other end of their decision. Mm. It's only at that point will we really see a strong culture emerging and and change happening. Mm. Um, I'm sure the commissioners have got some questions, if you can spare us uh, just a little more time for any of the commissioners' questions or comments. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Ms Eastman, and thank you, Commissioner. I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. I don't, but thank you for your evidence this afternoon. Commissioner Mason. Um, Commissioner, thank you for your evidence. Very clear and concise um, and very thoughtful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I do have some questions. We're not letting you off the hook (laughs) too quickly. Uh, A couple of things. One is... In terms of how the Queensland government engages and includes the voices of people with disabilities in Mm. terms of monitoring the Act, how do you think? Do you have any comments or views? How well are they doing it? Uh, Is there room for improvement? Are there things that we can model for our own final report? Um, I think the position paper that the National Commission has produced... Um, on the national framework it does include a proposed duty of participation and I, I think that is again something that could be looked at in the in the review of the Queensland Act. Um, I, I think there's a responsibility on, on governments to ensure that they are engaging with organisations representing people living with disability uh, I do know that the Queensland Disability Network, for example, does have a very strong relationship with government and works closely with my organisation. And I um, would expect they would um, play a significant role in the review of the Human Rights Act as well. So I hope that answers your question, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, my other question relates to your answer to the last question from Ms. Um, Eastman. In particular, I was struck by your response around recognising you know, the dignity of the rights holder. In this Royal Commission, we've heard many different views about interpretation of human rights. Now, to be clear, I'm not asking you for your view on how we interpret a particular human right. I'm interested to know from you, what are the success factors to bring people along that conversation and that dialogue. And you mentioned, for example, police officers and explaining to them, what, what are some more success factors that you've observed or you think we can consider to try and get to what I would describe as realisation of human rights? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And um, it's a very broad question, I yeah. guess. Uh, I do think it, it is about empathy. It's a essentially a a framework for empathetic decision-making. The more that you can convey to decision-makers and try to get them to put themselves in the position of the people at the other end of their decision-making, I think the more likely you are to get get them to give proper consideration to human rights. Um, And I... I refer to dignity because I think that everyone understands when their own dignity has been trampled on. I think everyone really gets that. Obviously, it's not the only principle underpinning human rights. It's freedom, respect, equality, 
dignity and also autonomy, which is obviously a major part of the um, principles in the CRPD. Um, but I do th I do think that dignity is something that that people do innately understand. Uh, thank you. To close that off, you talked about you know empathy and empathetic decision making. If you can't, for example, achieve that in say a room of particularly individuals or people you're talking to, what would be one or two other considerations to try and get you know more progress? Uh, litigation. <laughs> um, I, I, I do. I do think there needs to be consequences for flagrant breaches of of human rights. Um, and uh, at the moment, we we do have limited mechanisms available under the Act. Thank you, Miss Eastman. Can I check with uh, the party would leave to appear if they have any questions? Um, I don't think they do. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, thank you very much for your very uh, important contribu contribution, particularly the insights you've provided us with how the Queensland Human Rights Act is, has been uh, implemented here in Queensland. So thank you very much. Thank you. Ms Eastman, are there any other matters that we need to consider no, before we adjourn? No other witnesses for today. So that concludes today's proceedings. And if we can resume tomorrow at 10 a.m. Right, thank you. We will come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.